Looks like we're on. I hope we're on. We'll see how it goes. Take a second. If you're still on TikTok, find us over on YouTube Live. We're going to have the comments um, running and I'll be able to see what people are saying and asking. Today, we're going to be talking a lot about uh, tenants. Uh, we're going to be talking about tenant re retention. And we're going to be talking about tenant and tenant screening, how to acquire new tenants, how to get new tenants, good tenants, um, hopefully not bad ones. And that's always, always a huge challenge, as everybody knows, for uh, the landlords everywhere. So I'm popping on right now, setting this up, and hopefully we got people going to be joining us on YouTube Live in just a second. Take a second if you're still on TikTok, find us over on YouTube. It's uh, Two Guys Take on Real Estate, and the link is right in our bio for it. It'll get you on over there to uh, get going. Um, all right, let's see if we're running. All right, cool. All right, so yeah, so basically today we're gonna to talk a little bit about tenant screening. We get a ton of questions about people, how do you screen tenants? How do you deal with uh, taking care of tenants and uh, you know, and dealing with bad tenants? And the first way to deal with bad tenants is to not freaking have them. <laughs> so how do you deal with that? That's the best way to do it is to not have them in the first place. If you own a rental property, if you're house hacking, which we teach all the time, if you've been watching your TikTok or YouTube channel, we've got a lot of content about that. And uh, that is something we certainly talk about. If you're house hacking, at some point you're gonna be dealing with tenants, you're gonna have to have tenants. So um, avoid that uh, situation where you run into bad tenants by uh, putting in your own, putting in hopefully decent people. I always say the eviction process starts with the application. And uh, certainly that can, that can turn out to be quite true. Uh, so what we're gonna talk about today is, uh, is getting started, finding good tenants, and believe it or not, every little aspect of the process uh, itself is an important thing. You shouldn't look at it as like, what's the one best and most important thing I can do to have a good tenant that uh, really what you should be thinking about is, uh, um, you know, uh, every little step uh, incrementally making a very, very strong chain uh, of events that leads to a good tenant. So if you're still on TikTok, take a second, find us over on YouTube. And if you're on YouTube, as you're here, uh, I have a screen set up, so I'll be able to see comments as they come in. Uh, we're going to talk about screening tenants and how to get started doing that. And first of all, uh, these all sorts of tenant screening practices are going to be very, very different from state to state. So always, 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 and I'll say this probably hopefully throughout the broadcast, uh, follow your local laws, look into this stuff. But the basic idea, and this should be regardless of laws, right? Because ethical people don't always need laws, but, uh, you know, you want to treat everybody fairly and everybody kind of the same, right? So uh, that's an important thing to think about as you're doing this um, is make sure you're using the same kind of screening criteria on everybody. Now remember, there's all sorts of different types of protected classes. There's gonna be people protected based on race or religion or you know all these other things, age and everything. So you wanna make sure you're treating everybody the same uh, when it comes to applying whatever criteria you choose to use to screen. Now, it's not just about criteria. For me, I love the fact, and, I, and, and this is super important because later, as your, your tenant, your actual existing tenant, this stuff becomes important. It's conditioning and it's training a tenant to follow your process. Uh, why it's important up front is because later on, it really, really comes in in terms of things like communication. So if a tenant won't follow your uh, procedures and your uh, the way you operate in terms of getting started, they probably aren't gonna be people uh, that are gonna follow your procedures and, and, ish and things later when it comes to resolving issues. So what do I mean about that? Well, it could be, um, you know, early on, if there's somebody who just refuses to use your practices, they will then, uh, to get started, they'll then refuse to use your pra their practices to report things like a maintenance issue, which will then lead to further frustration on both parties and a tenant probably claiming that they've had issues for a longer time than is really necessary. Uh, so that's really, really important, and that's why all of our tenants that exist, right? They all report their issues and and uh, and questions and everything in the same way, uh, and it's because they were all pretty much onboarded in the same way. So I love it because we can handle more and more tenants with less and less time because we automate everything. Everything goes through a website. Every, if a tenant has an issue with uh, a non-emergency issue of any sort, you know, a leaky faucet or whatever in their apartment, they can go to their web, our website. They can put in a ticket. They know what that means to do that. Um, versus other tenants that have always rented from a mom and pop, they just, they pick up the phone and they call their landlord and they expect that the guy answers the phone and then he stops by later after work or, or whatever it might be. So they're used to two different types of things. Our tenants are all conditioned to be used to the way we do it. And um, we always stress the benefits. Now, the way of why it's important that they follow our process, faster results, less frustration, um, you know, a more uh, 100%, you know, a closer to 100% success rate in terms of resolving the issue in a timely fashion. 
And we stressed that right from the beginning. But most importantly, it's not a big adjustment for them because they started off with us by doing things electronically. So we like it that way because it helps us also document everything, which is super, super big. So we're going to get back to it. We're going to talk more about, remember, talking about tenant screening. I'm going to see if I can, I'm new to this board, so I do apologize if this thing kind of sucks a little bit for the way I use it. Um, so we're talking today about, <laughs> see, already making a, making a mess here, uh, tenant screening. I'm Mr. Two Guys. I'm going to be your instructor for the day. So anyway, tenant screening. Um, it's a process. It's not just like, oh, hey, run a credit check, and that's how you do it. Uh, that's important to do as well. But uh, you know what? Is this all backwards on the TikTok feed? Probably on the other feed, too. I, get you. I bet you guys hate me right now. Let's see if that works better. Uh, it's coming across right in the other thing. Good, good, good. Um, okay, so tenant screening. We're going to talk about that. So uh, we like to do it right off the bat. We will advertise our property. So how do you advertise your properties? That's the first step. If you're doing it through uh, maybe through Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist, uh, we like to do our advertising and it's an electronic method because we can kind of cut and paste, throw an ad up there, have somebody do it. It takes two minutes. They get everything tossed online. Now, that means the prospect you're finding is already online. Uh, they're fairly comfortable with being online, presumably. And the next thing you can do is you can ask them to fill out an application or pre-application as we like to call it. Go through some basic screening stuff. I will tell you, I'm going to see some comments here. Sorry, I see Rob. What's up, Rob? Thanks for commenting. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we're going over tenant screening. Buy a house feels unachievable. Everything just keeps getting more expensive. My God, uh, we're going to talk. Is it Ja Rule? Uh, we're <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about that at some point. But I, we just bought one. We crushed it. Uh, absolutely crushed it. And we uh, make this stuff a reality for you guys too. So please stick around on our videos. We can show you how this stuff is very possible. Um, and Victoria's dead on right. The Burr method is a great way to get to get going on this kind of stuff too. Yep. Um, so we we start off with having our people online uh, viewing our leads, our, our 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 prospects, right? And what they do from there is they say, "Listen, this is interesting." Now we've come a long way. It used to be we're a very mom and pop. And by the way, if you're still on TikTok, please click the link in our bio. Find us over on YouTube. Uh, and we'll be able to uh, to uh, to help and answer some of your questions and comments over there. If you are still on TikTok, for some reason refusing to go to YouTube, at least click the screen a whole bunch of times. And YouTube people, please drop us a like so more people will find this video. We've come a long way. It used to be that I had a cell phone and we would uh, we would just advertise on Craigslist. People would call my cell phone and say, hey, I want to see the property on 123 Fake Street. And I was like, sweet, no problem. I'll be right there. And I would Drop whatever I'm doing, whatever I'm working on. I was thinking I was even helping fix houses at that point. Can you believe that? And I would go running over to show them an apartment um, or I would set up a time with them to show them an apartment and they would absolutely flake. 50% or more would just not show up for the time they set up. Uh, why? Well, because a lot of things. I didn't have a lot of, I didn't build a lot of value with them. They said they wanted to see a place. Um, they probably called 10 other places. Uh, they shuffled me in. They're super late. I didn't build any value. I didn't say, wow, I'm really busy. I have 10 other people interested. I didn't do anything to establish any value of my property or my time. Uh, they literally called, I answered, you know, and then they just blew me off because I was a low value to them. Uh, doing it online and helping them understand, we would send an auto reply back now and we'll say, listen, uh, thanks so much for your interest. Before we can, you know, invest our time into showing you a property or wait or sp have you spend your time in seeing a property, we need to make sure you pass some basic, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, requirement or criteria that we ask everybody. Uh, here um, that we would, uh, you know, go go with or, you know, approve uh, is able to meet. So that's kind of the thing we would do. And what we'll do is we have some basic guidelines. So we'll have a few guidelines, right? These are really, really important because I, the amount of people, you'd be amazed at the amount of people that used to ask me if they could rent a $1,000 a month apartment and their income, literally their monthly income uh, was $1,200. That's going to fail, guys. Don't rent to somebody who's got $1,200 of income, don't rent them a $1,000 apartment. Don't let them make those horrible, horrible choices for themselves uh, because it's going to cost you big, but it's obviously going to not end well for them. So help them avoid some really, really poor mis cho uh, choices that they're making. Uh, and, you know, of course, don't make that poor choice yourself. From a business point of view, it's a terrible idea. This will end in failure. They will struggle. They will fall behind or stop paying. They have to have food, uh, money for food and all sorts of other stuff, utilities, lots of other things. No way realistically that that's going to work. So don't let them do it. So one of the things we always talk about is having some kind of income requirements.
Huge. Have some income requirements. I don't care what they are. Sorry, I know we get some light uh, in a shining here. I, I'm doing my best to get this stuff set up. Uh, so yeah, it doesn't really necessarily matter exactly what they are, but something you feel very comfortable. What many, many landlords do and, uh, and people that are renting out homes. If you're, again, if you're house hacking and you're following some of our methods to learn about how you can live for basically no cost by just buying a multifamily home, living in a unit, renting the other ones out, you're gonna to have to do this stuff. You're gonna to wanna to make sure these things have as high success rates as possible because that's covering your costs, your mortgages and your expenses. Um, make sure that, that whoever you're offering your home to, your rental to, meet some income requirements that you set. You can't change these things person to person. You can't look somebody up and down and be like, well, tell you what, you seem really nice. You seem like you know my type of person. So. The last guy, yeah, I told him he didn't make enough money to rent here, but I got a good feeling about you, and, and we will, we'll waive that requirement for you. You can't. That's very. It's going to open you up wide open to discrimination claims, and uh, again, depending on where you're from, in this state, I'll tell you, you can make a, a random accusation of a discrimination claim, and the, uh, the, the person has to defend themselves against it. That costs a lot of time and money, uh, so it's very, very easy to bring claims with almost nothing. You can bring claims out of vapor. And uh, then the person has to sit there and try to defend and deal with that. Why would you want to open yourself up to that? Have just basically uniform policies that you set up for everybody. Uh, I see a whole bunch of comments over on our YouTube live that I'm checking out. And guys, if you're on TikTok, please take a second. Find us over there on YouTube live. You can click the link in our bio to get there. Um, can't qualify for a mortgage and live near Toronto. So everything's out of my price range. 100% job rule. In some cases, you know, you just can't live in some places that are priced I, I would love to have lived in a super nice, wealthy neighborhood my entire life growing up, or my entire adult life for that matter. Uh, I couldn't afford it. Of course, I lived in an area that had prices that you know reflected what I could afford. Um, so there is going to be a certain level of that. Um, so income requirements. Here's here's a general one that so many people do: three times one month's rent. Three times one month's rent. That's a really normal practice. So if you are renting an apartment out for a thousand dollars a month, no utilities included. What you're going to want to do is you're going to require your tenants, your prospective tenants, uh, to be able to show that they make an income of three times one month's rent. That's three thousand dollars a month. Not a lot of money. Uh, now, if you're renting to a couple or you know whatever, I mean that could be really really easy to obtain. Husband and wife, maybe a couple of roommates. Um, easy easy stuff for most people. It's pretty. It's, it's not that challenging. Uh, however, it does give them a lot of breathing room if it's only a third of their income each month. Um, now, a lot of people will fall into the bucket of they, uh, they make a little money, but they don't pay taxes on it. It's all under the table. They're basically ev evading taxes with it. Um, that is going to be one of the challenges if you're renting to somebody who's in an industry or just, you know, maybe collects income from the state and then actually does work on the side. So they are basically cheating the system. Um, this is going to be one of the drawbacks to people that choose to cheat the system. Uh, so that's going to be a huge, huge problem for them. And uh, as much as you, you know, they might... Want, you might want to rent to them because you feel very, very confident they can afford it. You have to stick to what you put together as a policy. Because remember, if you don't, if you deviate, all of a sudden an accusation could be made that you did it because you're discriminating against this specific um, protected class. So if you use race, for instance, or if you use religion, for instance, uh, you know, you have somebody who you said no to uh, because they didn't income qualify. And then you get somebody else who's a specific religion, uh, religion. And you say, oh, you don't qualify. You don't make enough money. He's like, no, no, no. I'm, I'm an auto mechanic. I work, you know, uh, on the side or I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a waiter or a waitress. And I, I get a lot of tips. I just don't report them all. So I have a ton. I can show you that. I get look at all this money. And you say, oh, wow. OK, I get it. I told that makes a lot of sense. I'll rent to you. Well, the person you said no to finds out about that. And it's not that hard, hard to find that out. Um, they turn around and say, wow. I can't believe it. The second he found out I was whatever religion or the second he saw me in person or talked to me and he found out I was such and such race, that's when he said, no, he wouldn't rent to me. And it can be turned very easily turned into something completely different, something that it's not. So make sure you have income requirements. Make sure you stick to this stuff so, and you apply it evenly to everybody. And folks, if you're still on TikTok, please take a second. Find us over on YouTube. You can click the YouTube link up in our Stand With Me link in our bio. Uh, ja Rule. Ja Rule. Um, I still love the name finances of my life. That's why I look for content like this on YouTube. Awesome. Uh, I just want to be financially free. If I had the chance, I would buy, I would build a house by myself. Well, again, we, you know, we go over a lot of different methods and Ja Rule house hacking might be one of them. Um, you also using the Burr method and hard money to get started might be another one. So we appreciate you checking us out over on YouTube and hopefully some of this feedback 
coming in handy for you. And if you are on YouTube, drop us a like while you're there. If you haven't already subscribed, please do that too. So income requirements, that uh, sounds like a no-brainer. Now, what if there's some stuff included, you know? Uh, a lot of properties include utilities, my favorite, right? Including heat, including hot water. Uh, why would a landlord do that? That seems terrible, right? Because there could be a lot of abuse to that system. I mean, we've all seen situations, right, where we know about, you know, tenants will, I mean, God, I, I've seen it where tenants will come to the door and they'll have their, their you know, they're, they're just wearing a short, maybe a tank top and it's the middle of winter. The heat's cranking. It's 80 degrees outside. Um, tenants can absolutely abuse it. Why would a landlord do that? Well, Sometimes the landlord doesn't have a choice. Uh, sometimes it's a property that has one heating system for the entire property. It's a multifamily building. Um, there's a lot of reasons like that. Um, myself, I think you can even get away on a single family house, on a multifamily house, even when you have multiple heating systems in them. I think there's a lot of ways you can actually make more money by including utilities in the rent. And uh, that might be a whole subject for a different video. If you've ever thought about that, can you as a landlord, TikTok, YouTube people, think about it. Maybe maybe talk about it in the comments. Can you make money by extra money, more money for the landlord by including heat and hot water as part of the rent? Um, I'd love to hear some feedback. I think that should get some good discussion going. And if you haven't found us already over on YouTube, please take a second, click the button in our TikTok bio so you can find us on YouTube. So income requirements, huge, huge thing. Treat everybody the same. Make sure those in income requirements are provided and, and applied uniformly. Well, what else? I know somebody's probably said it a million different times in some of the different chats, uh, credit. Credit, what a great way to tell if somebody's financially trustworthy. You're trusting that you're gonna provide them a service and you know it's really, really hard to unwind that once you get going. Of course, take a look at their credit, see what kind of a, see, you know, see what kind of faith you should have that they're actually gonna pay you for the services you're providing uh, and the risk you're taking on. Big, big, big thing, so credit. now. I mean, I got to be honest, I have a lot of uh, challenging um, tenants. I have a lot of properties that are in challenging areas that are going to um, probably be taken by tenants that, uh, you know, don't have the best credit. So for me, <laughs> I got to tell you, it almost doesn't make sense checking credit on most of my incoming tenants at the majority of those kind of properties. So that's a really, really good question. We actually had a conversation, Matt and I, and if he was here, he would tell you, listen, have, you know, we have way too many people not paying their rent. Oh my God, we got to get tighter on our screening practices. We're getting murdered. We're never going to be able to stay in business. And I said, dude, he, I was, what, what would you like to see me do differently? I'm happy to talk about it. He says, well, what kind of credit scores? We shouldn't be taking anybody unless they have at least a 700 credit score. Otherwise, clearly these people are going to be deadbeats and they're going to screw us over and they're not going to pay their bills. We're going to lose the house. And I said, God, <laughs> what, what person do you think, you know, with a 700 plus credit score is gonna rent in some of the location. They're gonna live across the bridge in the suburbs of whatever city. They're gonna go somewhere else. We don't have anybody that rents in these types of homes or that's interested in these kind of properties that has good credit, man. So you have to identify your market and you have to um, set up a credit standard, I would say, that just makes some logical sense to what it is you're providing. So uh, consider that, but I'm gonna put a question mark here. There's another reason because it, why maybe to put a question mark here for it. And this seems like the no brainer. I mean, I'm sure I'm hopefully maybe not. I know everybody's pretty awesome on our channels, but I bet I'm being crucified as I start reading these comments. I bet some people are thinking to themselves, this guy's a freaking idiot. Who, who thinks you shouldn't check a credit score of a, of a prospective tenant? Look, being a small landlord, a couple of units, I could totally see that because you know what? You're only spending a couple of bucks, but credit checks cost money. And if you're going to have a hundred units, or get up to 100 units, and you've got a ton of people that are applying all the time, and you're running credit checks, credit checks, you run 10 credit checks, I mean, you run, up, you run 50 a month, I mean, that could get very expensive for you. And in most places, I, again, different state laws, and always check your state laws and stuff, but a lot of places do not allow a landlord to charge an application fee. So that means these people are coming out of the woodwork. This could be a person who never worked a day in their life, don't have any income, they don't have two nickels to rub together, and they want to rent an apartment from you. So they're wasting your time. They know they can't get approved anywhere. They're still going to ask. And then you say, listen, sure, fill out this application. You got some income requirements to do. You know, check your credit. You're going to spend your time processing an application, checking some credit, you know, evaluating and talking to the person, et cetera. They just wasted a good chunk of your time. No chance of approval. So a lot of people say, listen, if I'm going to be processing your application, I don't want people wasting my time. I got to charge at least 30 bucks, 
50 bucks for an application, something to cover my time that it takes to process or for me to staff that to somebody to cover the cost of a credit check, you know? And um, also, you know what? Let's think about it. Maybe it'll, it'll prevent people from just applying everywhere. Just, oh, I'll just apply. Even if I don't really care, I'll see what they say. It'll stop people from wasting my time in general. Well, they don't allow that in a lot of places. This is one of them. You can't do it over here. So we don't charge an application fee. I certainly don't want to be uh, running credit checks for 40 different people that are looking for one apartment that anybody with a good credit score, and I'm kind of prejudging, I guess, but you have to know what you're, what you're renting, uh, is not going to want to live in. <laughs> you know, Somebody that drives a, a high-end Mercedes, you know, has an executive uh, management job, has an 800 credit score, is probably not going to look for, you know, a property uh, on, a, on a fourth floor walk up uh, on a street that is always in the news for, uh, you know, for some, uh, you know, some uh, violence and issues, right? I mean, you got to use your head a little bit. I don't know. Maybe they exactly would do that. But the important thing is you're not, you're not steering anybody, but you have to set up a process to always follow with everybody and treat everybody similarly. Um, so that's why I always say credit. Yeah, maybe, maybe, but you got to use that decision on your own uh, for your type of properties. If you're only having a couple of units and you're just house hacking, you're just getting started, yeah, maybe do a couple of credit checks for, for a few people. Hopefully you get pretty lucky and you're having you know quality people in applying. You're only doing a few credit checks, not costing you a ton of money or time to get going and you get somebody placed and you're moving, moving on. Um, what other things can you possibly do? I know you guys are out there probably screaming at me and screaming to yourselves, God, there's so many different things that are obvious. You know, uh, tell me more about what you do. What's on your, you said you have an application uh, and how do you do all that? Well. Like I said, we're not going to show an apartment to somebody uh, these days because we talked about my earlier situation where anybody, just anybody would call. I would just make it super easy for me to go zipping over uh, to show them an apartment and they just wouldn't show up or they would call me. Oh, I, I got busy. I took a nap. I forgot. You know, let's do it today. Let's do it tomorrow. And I get jerked around and spend a lot of my time. So now we make people basically pre-approve. I uh, have to pre-approve. They have to state what their monthly income is. I want to make sure they're hitting the income requirements, they have to, um, sorry, there we go. They have to um, report to us if they're currently being evicted, if they're not being evicted or, or ever have been evicted. So we wanna know a couple of things. I'll tell you, uh, this is for, for my stuff. So we want, um, we want uh, um, income. We want eviction history. That's big. That's really, really big for me. Uh, and I hope that's big for you guys too. Do you really want to take in somebody that just got evicted from the last guy? Probably not. Um, you know, the first thing people will tell me when they're getting kicked out of a place is we had to move my landlord, no fix, nothing. That's literally, when, as soon as I hear that, that is the biggest red flag uh, for me to definitely make sure I pay real close attention to that part of it, especially if they're from a landlord or somebody that I actually have some familiarity with, somebody that I actually know. Uh, hey, what's up? I see that Matt's on the broadcast. He's watching. Uh, thanks for helping out, Matt. Thanks for pitching in today. Um, hope you're hope you're resting and enjoying yourself. No, but seriously, Matt always, of course, enjoys uh, and, and is uh, certainly well deserved to have some time off. Eviction history, huge, huge, huge stuff, huge stuff. And so, for income uh, requirements, you just ask for W twos. No, not everybody works. Uh, not everybody gets W twos. I mean, I, so um, what I would say is this: I, you know. Um, Pay stubs is great. Uh, SSI uh, income, uh, proof of any kind of income coming into the house, hold uh, SSI you know, and disability uh, pay stubs are two easy ones. It doesn't have to be through earned income. It could be through all sorts of other type, type of things. So we have a few different ways that will allow people to bring in uh, some kind of documentation to show it. That's the big thing. That's just a big thing. Uh, eviction history, how do you even figure that out? You know, Well, first make them put it in writing, make them state to you that they absolutely have never been evicted. And then um, make sure you figure out a way to check to see if that's true. Um, chances are, if they've been evicted before, they may not be in the best. Uh, they may not be the best tenants. Look, sometimes people do fall on hard times, and life hits people, and they go through a bad patch. However, that's just not always the case. And if they lie about their eviction history, um, it could be for two things. It could be one because they're probably going to, you know, take advantage of the situation and screw you over too, like they did the last person. Um, or two, they think they're, you know, they're just going to get away with it or they're, they're worried that that will damage uh, their chances. They might be right. I'll take somebody that's been evicted. Um, I will. Uh, <laughs> and here's why. Uh, because I understand that life does happen. 
Um, a lot of times, though, I'll review it. And one of the big things is I will only take somebody if they've been evicted, if they've squared up any of the balance or any of the damages uh, that they owe. Uh, so that's a huge, huge one. And I will tell you, the other guys in the area, the other landlords and, and management companies in the area do the same kind of thing. If somebody rented from me and I had to throw them heck out because they, they, they cheated me out of eight months of rent, and that is something that happens a lot, guys. Um, they will go down the street to another management company and they'll try to rent and they'll come in with some kind of a, a you know bizarre story that they don't have any uh, you know a rental history they've never been evicted and they'll tell the guy no 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 and then when he finds out because he checks same as us and he sees well wait a second you, you you got evicted by Kevin you must have really done something wrong and it looks like you still owe him you know seventy five hundred dollars uh, you got a judgment uh, against you for seventy five hundred. We would never consider renting to you unless you go back to Kevin's place and square up with him. So we actually do that. And honestly, when people make a mistake, they do something wrong or they get in a pinch when they end up in a bad situation, um, I, I, you know, that sucks. But making it right is a, is a sign of somebody that's uh, you know, trying to do the right thing and, and really a sign of a good person. So um, I'll give somebody a second chance if they struggled at some point and then did what they needed to do to right the situation and right the person that they, they hurt and damaged. So if somebody did have an eviction, I might still rent to them if I can see and verify that they squared up with the previous owner. But that's a great way to do it. How can you find out who's been evicted and all that kind of stuff? Well, in our area, it's real simple. We live in Massachusetts, like I said, a lot of our properties are here. Real easy for me to go online and do a search on masscourts.org. You can do it right now too. If you ever want to check it out, it's mass, mass, M-A-S-S, courts, plural, dot org. And you can select, select the option for housing court. They actually have courts dedicated just to housing issues here. And you can type in somebody's name and you can find their entire hit court history. Some people, you'd be amazed. I've had applicants that have been evicted. They get evicted every couple of years. Uh, and it's been that way for about the last 15, 20 years for them. And that's just what they do. That's just the, 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 the process that, uh, you know, housing is for them. Those are dead giveaways of obviously people that you want to avoid. And a lot of them will say, no, <clears throat> they don't have an eviction history. And <clears throat> so to get to the point where I'll even show them an apartment, they have to tell me, they don't have to show it. They have to at least just tell me, yeah, I make three times a month's rent. Uh, nope, don't have an eviction history and I don't owe any money. Any money. Um, and those are the two, honestly, the two biggest things. We could ask about credit. You could, you could ask. Sure, why not? Doesn't hurt, costs you nothing to ask. Um, and the bottom line is, if at any point people are lying to you in writing, that's grounds for you to say, nope, I'm not renting to you. Uh, and that's a great, it, something you probably should do. If you start off your relationship with them lying to you a lot, that's probably a sign that you should not be doing any more business with them uh, and move on. There's gonna be way better people out there behind them. Uh, and what, I, <clears throat> what we used to do is we used to have this huge concern that we, we're taking too long to fill an apartment. So you got this pressure. If you're owning an apartment, you get this pressure. You're worried, right? Man, I can't believe this thing's vacant. Oh my God, I lost a thousand dollars of income. I got to cover the mortgage oh, and the taxes and the insurance. I got to cover all the expenses with no tenant in there. Um, I will tell you, it's way more expensive to be dealing with having put in a bad tenant than one or two extra billing cycles of uh, vacancy. So, um, I've learned that, as I totally tell you, we cover all sorts of different things that we struggled with. That's a great example of one. We were just too hurried to put somebody in there that we thought kind of qualified. So income, eviction, and you ask about the credit, and then um, you know, and then, then I'll agree to set up a showing for them, let them view the apartment. You're not spending a lot of time on this. They're not spending a lot of time on this. You're not jerking them around and making it impossible to see a place. They're gonna answer some questions. I'm not gonna spend my time on you if I don't know if you're real or not. I want to make sure you're real interested and, and verifiable, uh, you know, candidate for an apartment. Then you set up a showing. Guess what a showing is? Let me tell you, seriously, guess what a showing is? It's a huge, it's part of the, it's part of your screening process. Definitely. If they are somebody that shows up late to the showing, that's something that you should think of, you should think about and put in your head. If there's somebody that shows up and is incredibly disrespectful, rude, if they're, uh, I mean, you can see some warning signs from these kind of folks, you're going to be kind of rating their showing, uh, at least internally rating their showing, uh, because you're going to be showing that apartment to five different people, people that are respectful of your time, people that, you know, um, are, are very courteous and polite versus somebody that's swearing or, or whatever it might be, uh, big time, big time, big time. 
you're doing a showing, you're, it's an interview. They don't know that necessarily. I've had people tell, you know, I've had people that showed up 20 minutes late. I left after waiting 15 minutes and then they emailed in and they're furious and they're rude. I said, wow, I'm only looking to do business with people that respect my time. This is really inappropriate. Uh, and I know to myself, we dodged a bullet. Um, or they'll be incredibly, uh, during the process of getting to the showing, you know, they're emailing, they're back and forth, they're hostile, they're rude, they're snotty, they're whatever. And you say, wow, you know, you're really not making the best first impression here. Uh, how do you think this relationship is going to go if this is how we're already starting off? I mean, these are conversations you should be talking about and having and putting out there right from the get-go. You're, I love it when people are like, you know, when you get some tenant people out there that are advocates that are, you know, the landlord works for you. He does. He provides you a service. Uh, but he's also an authority figure, he, she, whatever. Uh, the landlord's also, to an extent, some kind of an authority figure. Um, they got to stand up for other tenants and their property. They have to enforce and impose rules and boundaries uh, and policies and procedures. So um, it's good to make sure that that kind of stuff is known and talked about up front uh, and say, listen, wow, I, you know, you're not making the best impression. Is this really the angle you're going for is to kind of be kind of rude to me? It seems like you're being a little rude. Uh, are you okay? Are you upset that I say something to offend you? And uh, you know, I, uh, well, then listen, thanks for your time. I'm going to be considering a bunch of candidates. I got a lot of people lined up to show it to and, uh, you know, best of luck, you know, with your search. Um, and you set up the showing and you can move on from there. Now, everything shows well. They like the apartment. You know, they met every all your criteria. The next step essentially for them could be to fill out an actual paper application with more details about all this stuff, including landlord referrals and landlord references. So I know this is another big one for people. They want to know, don't you call their landlords? So let me tell you, let me tell you. Landlords, <laughs> I hope you're not jumping in the middle of this and just seeing me trash talking right here. Landlords lie, all right? Landlords will definitely lie. Now, not me, not me. I always tell the truth, even when I lie. No, but seriously, landlords definitely lie uh, about bad tenants. Landlords bought, lie about bad tenants. Come on, I know you guys know this stuff, right? Everybody knows why. And I want to see some of these comments here on our YouTube Live. If you're on TikTok, by the way, find us over on YouTube Live. We got the uh, link to it right in our bio. And if you're on YouTube Live and you haven't liked and subscribed, shame on you. Do me a favor. Hit the like button. If you install security systems, alarms, and cameras. Sometimes we've had security systems and uh, alarms and cameras ripped down, stolen before, by the way. Um, what do you use as your reasoning to not rent to somebody based on non-tangible items like them being late or rude, et cetera? Uh, without giving them in, in, ammunition to discrimination. Good point. I document stuff, Rob. Uh, 100% stuff needs to get written and documented because these sometimes these claims will come in six months later and you do not recall it. Obviously, you're not going to recall everything, especially when you're working with any real volume. Uh, so right back, listen, the, uh, the showing didn't go so well. You were 15 minutes late. We really respect people that respect our time. Uh, so thank you so much. But, uh, you know, a lot of other people were showing up and, and you know, meeting us appropriately or whatever it might be. Um, so stick to the things that are tangible in your responses and in your denials. Uh, don't go like, well, you know what? You used slang, you used a, you know, profanity or used a language I didn't, I didn't like. I don't think I'd be able to understand you, you very well because you don't speak English as a, for, as a first language. So I, I think we're going to go a different way. Don't use those kind of things. So you got to be careful. You'd be amazed at what can be a uh, discrimination uh, practice. One of the things I will tell you is it's, very easy, and it's really not even that that boring. It's actually somewhat fun. Some of these people are pretty cool to take a uh, anti discrimination uh, type of course and get trained in it. Especially if you're going to do this for any reason, for any length of time. So if you're going to house hack and you're going to be dealing with tenants for the next few years, even if it's only on a small scale, like two or five tenants, right? Uh, still take these classes. This is a great way to open up your eyes to some expansion of this stuff. But tenants will lie about bad tenants. So if you're to ask for a landlord reference, what are you gonna get? You're gonna get a lie. And Rob on YouTube, ding, 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 absolutely is right again, past the trash. Why is tenants, why is a landlord gonna lie about a bad tenant? Because he wants that dirt bag out of there. This person is blasting their stereo at, at 6 a.m. or you know 2 a.m. or whatever it might be. They're constantly smoking in the apartment, tons of behavioral issues. They always have a story when it comes to paying rent late and, and, and part payments and 
all this other stuff. They're a huge jerk to him. He wants them gone. So, uh, boy, you're going to think, hey, I'm smart. I've been following two guys taking real estate here and on YouTube. And I'm going to call their landlord. And I'm going to check up on these guys. And uh, you get a hold of their landlord. And their landlord is, maybe the landlord's Matt. He's not here to defend himself. Let's make Matt to be the lying SOB landlord that's going to pass the trash. And Matt picks up the phone. And he says, oh, yeah, you're a... Uh, you want to rent to, uh, to to Bob from Unit 4A? Oh, boy. I'm going to be sad to see him go. Bob. Oh, he's been with me for, for just so long. Seems like forever. Yeah, oh, boy. No, not, does he pay? Oh, he pays his rent. Clean, apartment clean as a whistle. Sure, no sanitation problem. Hey, Kev, good luck with Bob. Boy, I'd love to be able to keep him. Tell him I'm sorry to see him leave. And then he just hangs up the phone. He's like, thank God. Getting rid of that guy. And that is 100, it is, let me tell you, I don't lie about bad tenants, and it's one of the hardest things I do. I would love to get rid of some of these people when they get landlord references uh, calling in about it. Instead, what do I do? I'd be very, very honest, and I will hang on to bad tenants because at least I've got the experience to be able to minimize the impact of a bad tenant on me, and I don't want them going somewhere else and train wrecking someone else's portfolio. So if you ever get one of my bad tenants, um, you know, and you, it's because you didn't call me. <laughs> if you call me, I'll have that conversation. I'll be like, dude, you don't want this person. Like, come on. Like, I, you want to see some, I can show you some stuff or just take my word. For, I'll show you some pictures. I'll, I'll go through their history and notes with you. And like this, they, this is bad. Like this, too. you know, and I will deal with it until I get them better, which probably at that point I won't be able to. They're not coachable or I get them out uh, on my own. And then they're floating. They're living on their cousin's couch, wherever they're looking. Uh, living. But if they're looking at rent from you, um, you know, it's not going to happen because you were smart enough to call me. But otherwise, if you called Matt, that guy might have lied about a bad tenant so he could pass that trash. Now, who would be a better tenant, uh, a better landlord to call? So not all landlords lie. Remember, only their current landlord is going to have a reason to lie because they want to get rid of him. Previous landlord, that's the guy. That's who you want to call. Not their current landlord to check on. The dude that was renting to him before, gal that was lending, renting to him before, you get the idea. That's who you want to, there, I don't want to know who your current landlord is. I'm looking for the one you had three years ago. Can you please give me their contact? Give them, Give the first guy, give the current guy a call too. Can't hurt, hurt. But seriously, talk to that previous landlord. There is no motivation to lie. They're gone. That tenant is out of their life. No reason for them to want to lie to you. If you're going to do a landlord reference, not a bad idea. That's the one that you want to put more faith in than the current existing landlord. I see some more comments. Uh, when doing the bird, you comp other rentals or flips, or does it matter? I'm sorry, uh, Carlos, we actually are talking today about tenant screening and tenant retention type stuff. So um, I'll do my best to get to some of the other kind of burr questions, but um, the chances are your best check uh, is to do the Ask Us Anything link and the Stand With Me link in our bio, or check our burr video, maybe drop a comment there, one of us can get back to you. So previous landlord, that's the gold mine, that's who you wanna be asking. And YouTube uh, people, I appreciate all the comments on YouTube Live right now. TikTok folks, if you're over there in TikTok land, I see it, uh, please take a second, find us in the YouTube link in our bio under the Stand With Me link. Uh, a lot of other cool stuff in there too, but you can come over and check us out and maybe I'll be able to check your comments over on the screen here on YouTube. So huge part of landlord uh, and tenant uh, interaction is knowing who to trust and who to get that reference from. And that's that previous landlord. You can do a lot of things. You can require people have rental history. You can require that they have at least two years of rental history. You're not going to probably rent to a lot of 18 year olds, are you? You might be okay with that, but that's fine. Put that in there. You can do a whole lot of other things when it comes to screening. I think I gave you some pretty good tips and some other ideas uh, about ways in which you can really screen those tenants, make sure You're screening them fairly. Don't go having one set of criteria for one tenant and then applying a whole different set to another person and saying, "Hey, listen, I rented to you. Uh, I, I rented to you because you were, you know, you, you work the same place I work, or uh, I, because I don't. I mean, God, remember, there's protected classes of people out there. Learn what they are 
learn about anti-discrimination laws, but set up whatever your criteria is that makes you feel safe and comfortable renting to people that fits within those laws, and then make sure you apply it to everybody the same, fairly. Uh, you can, I mean, so we, uh, we, one of the things they touched on was about income requirements. Three times one month's rent, it's pretty normal uh, in a lot of places, especially now as uh, landlords have, uh, have learned the hard way about having people in that don't qualify and uh, how hard it is. You might get stuck with some really, really bad people not paying for a very long time. Um, we talked about how you can make money by including utilities in a rental. How you can make money. It seems like you really you're setting yourself up simply for abuse and, and for somebody to overuse and cost you more. So, um, wow, how does that work? So let's talk about that because you're talking about income requirements. I do three times one month's rent if you're going to live in one of my apartments that includes nothing. But I change the income requirements if you're living in an apartment that includes stuff. So this is cool. More people can get approved if you're a little bit less income. Um, the rent's going to be a little bit more. So that $1,000 apartment rents for 1000 bucks with nothing included. But maybe that maybe you have an apartment that you either choose to include stuff on, which I think can be a moneymaker for you, a moneymaker for you. Or it's in a multifamily property that has one heating system, for instance, and one hot water system, and it's one system for all the tenants. You have to include it. Now, obviously, if you're supplying more stuff, you're providing more services, you're not renting for the same exact price. So $1,000 rent for nothing included might become $1,250 a month for an apartment with heat and hot water included. Now, there you go. So here's how it works, guys. And if you're on our YouTube uh, our YouTube Live, I appreciate it, and I wanna check out your comments. If you're on TikTok, please take a second, find us over uh, on our YouTube Live so we can uh, so we can check out some of your comments. And I wanna talk about that. A question, do you ask about how many people are in the house? Absolutely, you have a responsibility to know that. God, as if there's a fire, you need to be able to tell the fire department who's in that house that they need to rescue. So you wanna know every adult that's in the house, all adults need to be signing that lease. You're entering into a lease contract with everybody over 18. Yet, Two parents and a kid that's 18, still living at home, that's cool. That dude, that kid is part of that lease and signing. Uh, anybody that's an adult has to be evicted from the property. Uh, so if you just have the wife sign and the husband lives there with her and the 18 year old son and the you know minor uh, minor daughter um, and then all everything goes wrong and you gotta kick people out and you basically take your lease and you look and you're like, okay, J Jane Smith, she's my tenant there. She's the one who signed the contract. I'm going to evict her from the property and you do an eviction case of that household for Jane Smith because she's the one that she's your tenant. Um, great. And you win at court, you get your execution and you give it to the sheriff. The sheriff goes over there and he goes to evict and they got a whole bunch of people in there. You got Jane Smith, John Smith, the husband, and then little Timmy Smith, who's 18. He's an adult as well. And uh, well, the sh you know, you go to kick, kick them out and you don't understand why everybody's there except for Jane. You only evicted Jane. <laughs> you, you have to evict everybody that lives there. Otherwise, John Smith and their kids and the whole family are just going to keep living in the apartment. And guess what? Guess who they're going to have over for dinner every night? Maybe some sleepovers like seven days a week. Jane. So you didn't really evict anybody. So make sure you're on your lease. You're putting everybody that's living in that home. And then when you go to have to have an issue, when you go to bring somebody into court or whatever it might be, remember, you don't want to have to do this stuff, but people will give you no choice sometimes. Make sure you're listing everybody under 18 as part of uh, anybody over 18 as part of the eviction process. Otherwise, you're only going to evict one household member, and uh, the rest of the household will stay there. Um, so I want to take a, take a minute here again. We want to go back to what we were talking about screening tenants. We were getting onto this really really cool thing where I can help you guys know how you can make more money by including utilities at your property, uh, and also widen the ability for you to rent to more people. Maybe your properties are in a little bit more of a tougher area, lower income area, and three times one month's rent for whatever reason uh, is a little bit tough for people to get approved for. First of all, that, that's a little bit scary. You know, I want qualified people. I, I don't want to have high eviction rates uh, because that means I lost money. If I evict somebody and I win, I still lost a lot. It sucks. I don't like doing it. Uh, and I don't want to see you fall into that trap either. So uh, everybody that's watching on YouTube Live, I've been saying it and saying it and saying it, and here it is. How do you make money? Well, so first of all, so uh, here it is. How do you make money on including heat and hot water as part of your rental? Well, first of all, you're charging. So you're charging a thousand for nothing included, and then you will say, "We're just coming up with random numbers, guys." Uh, and then we're going to say you're going to be charging twelve fifty for having heat and hot water included. So you're charging more because you're offering more with the property. If you were including appliances, you should charge a little bit more than an apartment where you're not including appliances. Same kind of thing. Um, 
So now when we include heat and hot water, we don't necessarily, now we don't make sure, we don't make the income requirements the same uh, because we can change them up a little bit. The income requirements on those property is that the rent shouldn't be more than 43% of your income versus you know about 33% of your income. Remember, the tenant doesn't have huge heating and hot water bills to pay for anymore. So you're not as concerned anymore about them not having enough monthly income to cover their household. I hope everybody follows that, right? So and if, by the way, TikTok people, please double tap the screen if you're hanging out in TikTok or find us by joining the link in the bio and stay with me link to find us and join us on YouTube. Um, 43% is what we do. And again, these are my numbers. Your numbers can be whatever you want, as long as you apply them fairly to everybody for people that have utilities like heat, hot water included in the apartment. How do you make money doing that? Uh, how do you make money by including heat and hot water? Because you all, we all know, right? If somebody has a lot of crap included in their apartment, it's wintertime, they're gonna crank that heat, you know, walk around with, I mean, I've, I've seen it. They walk around with shorts, tank tops, they don't care. It's included. Make it toasty. Make it nice. It'll look like it's on a tropical vacation. Meanwhile, I mean, probably a lot of you guys too, but I came from a household where we heated with a wood stove. You have that, that, that front door open too long coming in, you know, you open the door and you start taking your shoes off and you, you know, your mom's yelling at you, shut the door. What are you born in a barn? Are you kidding me? It's you're letting all the heat out, right? Pretty normal, pretty common for people that grew up like that. But now if they're having all this stuff paid for as part of the rent, especially if they don't like you, aren't conscious or don't really respect you, maybe you didn't do a great job screening in general. Um, wow, so they're just gonna crank the 80. Maybe they'll open open the windows up. I have people who have literally, they would leave their windows open for fresh air. You gotta have some fresh air, gotta circulate them. It's negative 14, why are you, why are you letting your, why are you open the window, let your heat up? So let me tell you, how can you make money by doing that when so many people are gonna be abusive, they're gonna crank the heat, etc. Well, it's not def definitive, it's not definite, but if you can make more money, you just have to be very on top of your game. Uh, so first I'll tell you, you don't probably even need to do anything. You might have just good, responsible people. They only turn the heat up to 70, 72 in the winter time. They're good about keeping the doors and their windows shut like any reasonable person paying their own utility bills would be doing in the winter time. And you don't have any abuse. You know, they're, they're not taking two and a half hour long showers with unlimited hot water because, you know, you're paying the bill. You might have just regular good conscious tenants and that might be great. You might have to not worry about it, but you should always be monitoring your utility bills. If you see a blip, if you see something that's egregiously off, especially over like the history of what uh, what the you know, property used, um, that's something you need to jump onto and start dealing with. Make sure if you're renovating the apartments, make sure you're putting in heating systems that are very efficient. You know, if you have this old, they used to call them snowman heating systems. Does anybody have an idea of what a snowman heating system is? I've seen, I've shown them off on our live on TikTok quite a few times to our TikTok followers. A snowman heating system looks like a big old snowman. It's a huge furnace. I think it's bigger than me. And it's covered all in this white coating. And that white coating is asbestos. Uh, so it looks like a big old snowman. And if they're using asbestos to insulate it, you can guess how old it must be. <laughs> Not very efficient. For every dollar you're burning, literally 40, 60% of it is just going right out the exhaust, right up the chimney. Uh, and not getting uh, getting uh, you know your your value out of uh, in terms of heating your property. So make sure you have good efficient heating systems if you're going to include heat and hot water. And uh, there, so that's a really really and really important thing. And I cannot stress that enough. Make sure you have efficient heating systems before you decide to take this on. And then secondly, right, if you're going to include heat and hot water in your property, take a couple of steps. It, it, maybe maybe be really high tech and do some smart thermostat and monitoring devices, but otherwise have a thermostat. We do them in a lot of our places and let tenants know ahead of time. You'll let them adjust the heat. Yeah, heat's included. You'll let them adjust it. You can let them crank it up to the 70s in the wintertime, but only up to 72. Not, not 79, not 80s, 72. That's, I think, very comfortable. And you want to make sure you have a seat. Again, if you have a decent heating system, it is balanced. It's not like one room is worse than another room. It's all evenly heated. And make sure your property has decent windows on it, guys. Don't be doing this kind of stuff. If you've got the old wooden pane, uh, wooden, you know, wooden sash, uh, single pane windows that were built with the, uh, put in when they built the house, that's crazy. You're all, you're, again, not efficient. Good, efficient heating systems, updated windows. Make sure you're doing this in the right property. And then you can make money. So how do you make money? Well, you're charging an extra, in this case, for round numbers, we use $250 a month. So $250 extra is your bump. Right? So now it's $12.50 a month for the heat and the hot water included. You're charging that all winter long, $12.50 a month, even if the heating bill is $400, maybe, uh, $300, $400. Uh, 
But guess what? You're charging it in June, you're charging it in July, you're charging it in August, you're charging it all year round. You're getting an extra two fifty a month all year long. Pretty good stuff. While you're not running your heat, while they're not running the heat, you have taken a lot of steps to make sure you're heating as efficiently as possible. You're making sure your heating system's up to date, like nice, a good heating system. Your, ha- your home, decently weatherized. You don't have huge gaps under your doors, old windows that are just, you know, your curtains are blowing in the wind, right? So, <laughs> so when, when the window is closed. So making sure your home is, is decently set up for heating and all the good stuff you should be doing anyway. And then you adjust your rent to cover the cost of it uh, but by profiting every month. You're limiting how much they can really abuse the system. You maybe have a 40 gallon hot water tank that can't take three hour long hot showers. I've seen people do this, 100% do this. Um, I mean, not, I haven't been watching people take three hour long showers. That came out wrong, uh, but you get the idea. I know people have excessive water bills. I know they run their, their stuff too long. I've seen people thawing out meats, just running, 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 running the water uh, until it runs, la- runs out. So the bottom line is you can control how much they uh, abuse it. And then you can control how much uh, efficiency you have in the home and you can adjust the rents up to cover it and make money every, uh, every year. On it. You're not looking at it over on a monthly basis because in January, especially if it's really, really cold, your heating uh, costs, your bump might not be enough to cover the entire utility usage. That's fine because you're making up for it in all the nice bump months as well. Uh, Taking my real estate agent exam this year. Oh, awesome. Very good, man. I love to hear that stuff. Gregory says, will we be able to view this live afterwards? I have to jump out and jump. Yeah, absolutely. This is going to stay up on our YouTube, no matter how terrible I look on camera and how bad this thing goes. Yes, it'll be here. So please keep an eye on us. If you haven't already liked and then subscribed and did all the awesome stuff that'll keep you on a great channel like this, please do that, Gregory. We'd love to hear from you guys. We'd love to see the comments coming in on our YouTube live. Folks on TikTok, if you're still there, Jump over to YouTube Live. We got our link in our bio. You can find us there. And guys, there's going to be a link on all of our videos here on YouTube, the Stand With Me link. There's so much cool stuff in there that we do, including an Ask Me Anything feature. I say ask us anything, but Matt's not here, so you're only getting half of uh, the two guys take on a real estate team today. If a tenant stops paying, can you stop paying for the utilities? Hell no. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> no, Rob. Uh, never do anything like that. You're 100%. You, you'd be bigger trouble. Um Yes, so that's con- called a constructive eviction. It seems 100% fair to me, to be honest. Somebody's not paying to live in your property. Guys, I'm human, and that's ridiculous. You're not paying me for my services, but then you're going to require that I continue to provide my services? Screw you. I would love to be able to legally go and shut the water off, stop paying for trash collection, stop mowing the lawn for these people to have barbecues in when they're not paying me, stop repairing the damages they make to my property when they're not even paying for the use of it in the first place. That seems completely fair, but it's not. Always follow your responsibilities. Handle all the maintenance issues that come up. You're supposed to handle them. Handle them as if you were getting paid. Do everything as if you were getting paid. And then hold them accountable. I mean, I know we got all going to get screwed in the eviction moratorium, right? But then hold them accountable when you legally can. The process sucks. It's not very fair, but it is the process. And you knew this going into it, guys, because you follow our channel. So you really can't complain too, too much about it if you know the rules before you start playing the game. Um, <clears throat> okay, so. With that being said, we've been talking a lot about how to screen tenants, how to screen tenants fairly, how to apply it to everybody so you're treating everybody the same. That's really, really important. You're going to get better tenants that way. And that's really important to you if you're starting off. man, Starting off and popping into a couple challenging tenants, a couple bad tenants, is going to be a backbreaker for you in terms of growth. If you've got bad tenants uh, in your apartments when you first start off on your few, it's gonna slow you down for years, guys, years. So seriously, uh, take a little bit more time. Don't just slap people in there because like, oh, you gotta get your mortgage covered, et cetera, et cetera. It can back you up for years of growth. Uh, I know what I'm talking about. This is why we're still working very, very hard to this day because we didn't have anybody providing this kind of content. This is why we talk about our success, sure. But we talk about our struggles so you guys can avoid some of the struggles we went through. All right, so let's move on a little bit to the second portion of the topic we're going to talk about today, which is good tenants. And how do you keep them? And this is my first time really trying to use this board. Matt uses it quite a bit. I suck at this because I don't know how to use it. So I hope I don't have any uh, technical errors here. I'm going to do my best. Don't kill me if this if, uh, if I run into some problems. Um, tenant retention, saving tenants, saving money, saving money, saving tenants. Can't even read it. Sam, are you doing it, Brad? Um, 
you get good tenants, you want to keep good tenants. That's so, so important. It's equally as important to keep good tenants as it is to quickly move on from bad ones. Bad tenants aren't always bad people. Sometimes they're just tenants that you didn't train properly. You can take a lot of blame for having bad tenants. A lot of it is on you, let me tell you that. This can be bad people that are out there all the time. Absolutely, that's gonna exist. Sometimes you allow a tenant to become a bad tenant because you didn't set expectations properly. You didn't manage those expectations. You didn't deliver on them. There's a lot of reasons where you could be the culprit. And we talk a lot about that, how to avoid that here on our channel, on YouTube and on our TikTok channel. But what I wanna make sure people know is if you have a good tenant, it's super important to keep them. And we're gonna talk a little bit about why and how and, and, and go into that a bit here. Uh, see another quick comment here. Um, are you going over creating leases in this video as well, or do you not met with that kind of stuff? Oh, we're not going to be doing it in this one. We do um, probably will have more of that content, Gregory, coming up. Uh, but don't forget, every state is going to be different. So uh, I'm trying to talk about general principles uh, that can be applied to everybody. Every state's going to have all sorts of different landlord tenant laws regarding leases, that kind of thing. Uh, what's that? You want? To, what's that? You want a new light fixture? Yep. Yeah. No. Seriously. Um, I. I. And we got to. I want to move on to the good tenant retention, but Todd. 100% right. Todd on our YouTube live feed right now is uh, letting us know. Same thing. I mean, man, I I've tried to reason with people that, that haven't been paying. And I said, listen, you know, you want the water to stay on so you can keep showering. You've been living here for almost two years. You haven't even paid us anything in the past two years. You haven't paid us enough to even cover the water costs for one month. How is that fair? I, I can't possibly do this. You want your lawn to stay mowed, right? Like the sidewalk shoveled so your kid doesn't slip in the, in the wintertime. Like how can you not think it's okay to, you know, but you got to do it. Uh, it. It's tough to do this stuff, Todd. Um, and that's why the best way to avoid people like that is to have a good screening process in place at the beginning. Uh, nothing's going to fix it. There is risk. This is risk. Uh, but hopefully as you grow as well, don't forget when you only have one unit renting, uh, when you have one unit to rent, it's very, very different when you have a non-paying tenant or a problematic tenant than when you have 10 units. And certainly way different from that when you have 100 units. So as you grow, you know, you want to identify this stuff, but also as you grow, it helps to phrase some of the expense and some of the risk at least. Uh, so good tenants, tenant retention. Let's talk about the cost of losing a tenant. I hope you guys can see this. This stuff here, this, what we're going through right now, will eventually be in the stand with me link in our TikTok and YouTube video by, uh, uh, descriptions. So <clears throat> you can, you will be able to find this at some point online in the stand with me link. I what I'm doing right now for you. I'm going to give you some of this, maybe all of it, completely for free. This is the kind of stuff that people legitimately pay a ton for. Uh, you can help us big time by supporting us, not financially, but just by clicking like on YouTube. If you haven't done it already, I mean, I'm literally begging, that will help our channel get off the ground and actually grow through the roof on YouTube. I don't know anybody that does it the way we do it. So please, if this is somewhat useful to you and you think you're gonna get some kind of value out of this, like, subscribe, push buttons that'll help our channels grow. Uh, that would be an awesome thing. You can always, always, always send us money and buy us coffee if you like to. We appreciate that, but not necessary. We are doing this to pay forward our struggles and our, our uh, success from 12 years or 13 years. feels like 35 uh, of dealing in real estate. So let's talk about the cost of losing a tenant. Oh, my God. Well, that's actually really, really important. So the cost of using it, I know I got some glare. Um, these numbers are going to be all sorts of different for everybody's market and maybe actually on the, on, the, on the very, very low side. Maybe I can turn this light a little bit here. Let me, let me try adjusting this light. Take a look at this and I'm going to go over it a bit with you. I'm going to try not to break everything. Are you rid of some of the glare? No. All right, there we go. So turnover costs, it's gonna cost you a thousand bucks, 15 bucks, 100 bucks, right? Gonna vary in materials and labor. So somebody moves out, you gotta fix up the apartment, you gotta repaint it maybe, you gotta, uh, maybe you got carpet, you gotta do, do a clean out of, of the property. Fix some holes in some walls, go over some stuff, right? 1500 bucks maybe, depending on how bad the last tenant was or how long it was rented. People aren't always terrible, but the longer somebody lives in the apartment, right? The more use it got and needs. Turnover time. Four to six weeks before a new unit is ready. What the hell? That's crazy. Especially if you're doing this stuff yourself. You're hopefully you're on it. Time is money. You're going to jump on it. But tell you what, you're not always doing this stuff yourself. Maybe you're working and you're renting out some properties. So you've got a career going and you've got a family. You do not have time to be renovating an apartment. So you hire a contractor. 
Now, if, this, if a good tenant leaves unexpectedly, this is the kind of stuff. You gonna hire a contractor? Sure, no problem. I can, be, I can book you for the first week of uh, September. Contractors aren't there just sitting around doing nothing, waiting for your call, some of them maybe. Uh, but good contractors might not always be. And uh, they might have to you know, book you out a little bit and then they ha have other jobs. They're not gonna do everything in one day. A lot of reasons why it could take several weeks before the unit's actually ready, clean, ready and presentable again. But that's what, guess what? You gotta start showing it. You don't even, that, that's just making the unit ready. How are you gonna rent? You can't show somebody a filthy, maybe smelly apartment that needs all sorts of work. You're gonna probably not have a great and successful screening process if you do that. So then the new move-in, might be four to six weeks from then. Remember, it may be, maybe I ask you about an apartment and you're like, yeah, you know what? It's gonna be finished and ready tomorrow. You can come on by and see it. And I go to I go to look at it, I said, this is really great. You know what? I'm interested, I'll take it. We follow all the paperwork, we finish stuff up. And uh, I have to get my landlord, of course I have to get my landlord notice. I'm a good tenant, I'm not gonna skip town on my old landlord. I'm gonna, of course, let him know I wanna move in. So that's where I go and I, and I, you know, I schedule a move in. It doesn't happen overnight, I'm not living out of my car. Uh, if our average apartment price, we'll say, is $900, whoops, in this case, which is very low, I think we all know, rents are still now going through the roof. If it's if it's 900 bucks, we lose up to $2,700 in vacancy while this thing has been sitting on top of any renovation costs. That could be several thousand dollars, maybe four grand. I mean, put some kind of random number to it. It doesn't have to be precise. You get the idea. Losing a good tenant, losing any tenant has a cost to it. Keep that number, these kind of numbers in your mind as you're thinking about how annoying that tenant you might be dealing with is. Okay, so, okay, I got it. So they always park in the wrong spot. You know, their rent's always a week late. Think about that and say, is it worth several thousand dollars to me to stop that tenant, to get rid of that tenant, replace them with somebody else who hopefully doesn't have any bad behaviors that'll get on my nerves or cause me a problem. So that's where you always wanna be internally weighing out the pros and cons of moving on from a bad tenant. Also guys, why I preach on this channel, I really tell you guys, coach bad tenant behaviors out of bad tenants, turn them into good tenants, keep tenants from becoming bad by learning how to coach them properly. Uh, but there you go, I mean, that's super huge. Uh, we're trying to put an A number to it, put in your own market numbers if you want to. My guess is that number's higher. Maybe you think you can do the turnover time and the move in time faster. Maybe, sure, we're just using some kind of numbers. We're just had to put some kind of number to it. Don't forget, there's lots of other hidden costs. This stuff doesn't all do itself. There's hidden costs associated with vacancy, manpower. Man, more work is created for tenant relations. Maybe it's you or your wife or your significant other or your staff who deal in maintenance roles, who deal with renting a new home to somebody or fixing up the new home for somebody. Um, screening prospective tenants, we just talked about that. That does take time. Somebody's putting in that time. Are you paying them or are you doing it yourself? There's a value to that. Um, you're doing showings. You know how, it's, how much it sucks to have to show an apartment 10 different times, especially when people don't always uh, fulfill their showings. They, they, uh, they, they're late. They reschedule at the last second. They need to, they show up, but then they need to show the wife. I mean, oh my God, you got to show it again. Uh, lots of things like that. Time consuming. You're paying somebody or you're doing it yourself. Again, that, that has a cost. Uh, subsidy paperwork, a lot of tenants move in, they use a subsidy, there's section eight, there's all sorts of rental assistance programs out there. I love working with those programs, but there's a lot of red tape, there's a lot of bureaucracy there. You have to do a lot of back and forth with case managers, workers, that you didn't fill out this form correctly, this one needs to get sent over, you know, uh, all sorts of crazy stuff. By the way, guys, if you're still here and you're watching and you're on TikTok, find us on our YouTube live. YouTube people, please do me a huge favor, Drop a like, subscribe if you want to hear more about this kind of stuff. We've got a huge channel, lots and lots of content, and I would really love to see everybody being able to check it out. So please drop a like. More people will know about us the more you click on all those fun buttons for us. Um, moving orientations. Don't just go slapping a, a lease on the table, hoping they don't read it and just sign on the last page and then throw them some keys or leave the keys at the house for them. You want to actually sit down. You want to go over a whole orientation. And I, that's a whole video on itself. You want to read through the lease. You wanna know, make sure they know what your role and responsibility is as a good landlord and what their obligations are as a good tenant. Um, work orders related to turnover. Guess what? The contractor forgot to put the smoke detectors back up. Gotta send maintenance out to do it or you've gotta go do it 
or the inspection uh, people for the subsidy program the tenants working with wants you to make a couple of changes. It is incredible. I mean, again, all states are different. <clears throat> all programs are different. But in our area, it's incredibly hard to pass a subsidy inspection on the first uh, try. Uh, my home, I absolutely would never pass. Your house, probably not either. Uh, on the first try through. It doesn't mean it's a dump. It means the inspector wanted something changed or maybe maybe actually you did find some stuff that technically was out of code. Not, you know, I'm not going to always explode a house, but these things need to get taken care of. Not a big deal. Um, but you got to have to send somebody over to take care of those things. A lot of back and forth. Everyday, rent, uh, everyday retention. Stuff you should be doing every day to retain a good tenant. Basically, you know, following your responsibilities. But you can avoid a tenant giving you a heads-up notice or emergency notice saying, I need to get out right now. Um, by doing some basic everyday practices, you know, have softer, customer-friendly work orders, not, you know, not being kind of pissed off when a tenant complains about something. Don't treat it like a complaint. Treat it like, you know, thank them. Thank, oh, my gosh, thanks so much for letting me know, you know, that uh, the faucet's leaking. That would have been my, my, or the toilet keeps running. Got to jiggle the handle. Thank you so much for letting me know. We'll take care of it. When's a good time to come over? I'm free on Tuesdays and I'm free on Thursdays. You know, be nice about it have, and thank them for letting you know. First of all, it's your thing that it stopped working properly, right? Second of all, in that case, in the, in the leaky toilet, that could save you hundreds of dollars in water bill. Um, quick and professional responses to maintenance issues. Like I, like I said, you know, get them taken care of quickly. Don't don't be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like me and the wife are on vacation. I'm not going to be able to, I don't really care. I'll get to it eventually. You guys don't really pay us, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, work on actually taking care of them. Uh, in, in a polite way, but also promptly as well. Uh, thank you cards. I mean, pretty obvious stuff. Who doesn't love a thank you card? I, I suck at doing this, but this is something where I should improve on, uh, to be honest. Providing amenities, um, maybe laundry, maybe laundry hookups in a basement. If it's a multifamily house, maybe put laundry hookups in there. Maybe supply laundry machines, you know, washer, dryer, maybe coin up, maybe not. Imagine how cool would it be if you've ever rented? I mean, I was in college, always going to laundromats and all that stuff, paying quarters were my life back then. And uh, how cool would it be if my landlord all of a sudden said, hey, tell, tell you what, you rented for me for a year. You've been pretty awesome. I want to keep you guys here. I want to keep you happy. I, uh, I went out and I went to Sears and I bought a whole bunch of, I bought a couple of washers and dryers down in the basement. Knock yourselves out. Just don't use it too much. Just for you guys. Don't go bring it all, all over your friends. Uh, groundskeeping. Fix up the property a little bit. Yeah, everybody's going to mow the yard. Sure. Maybe do some mulching. Put some plants in. Make the property just a little bit nicer. Continuous little bits of improvement. A little bit of money like that goes a very long way. Why? They see it every day. Their friends and family, their visitors see it when they come to. They pull into their driveway and they see you're taking care of the property. You're making improvements above and beyond. And bottom line is, you know, I think we talk about this later, but this is improvements to your property. They get the benefit of it. They feel like you care. Uh, they feel and it looks like you're actually trying to do something extra that you're not just only coming around to collect the money, which by the way, don't come around to collect the money. I mean, that's a whole other video. Better ways to do it than just than going to the house to collect it. Basements, provide storage, provide maybe garage access, basement access. Again, I don't like I don't like to do these things. I, I don't like to provide laundry. Oops, I don't like to provide basement access. All of this stuff is gonna depend on your market and your type of tenants and everything that you're dealing with. However, if you feel comfortable with it, provide basement access. If maybe you're already providing basement access in the basement for laundry or anything else, set up little storage areas for them. Might be an idea. Again, not necessarily recommending it. And honestly, a lot of times I recommend against it. But we can talk more about it. Periodic redeemable gifts. Maybe toss everybody a gift card once a year. Uh, you know what we used to do? I swear to God, we used to do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a quick second. Our first November as landlords, uh, we had a few units. We bought everybody a turkey. We delivered in person a frozen turkey to every single tenant. We didn't have a ton. We had a few uh, that November. And then next year, we did it again. We had a lot more tenants. The year after that, guess what we did? More turkeys, more tenants. Every November we did it for, wow, wow, almost 10 years. We did it for several years anyway. We got up to uh, giving away, nobody's going to believe me, giving away, I think, nearly 500 turkeys in a November. I mean, it was crazy when we started. We had, we, were, we had trucks and we had all the staff and we were taking different routes and we're bringing frozen turkeys to people. And it was bananas. Uh, we ended up, long story short, we ended up not doing that process, uh, that, that awesome thing. Uh, afterwards, but we did that for a number of years. It was one of the great things we were able to do. I loved being able to do that for tenants. It was just such an awesome thing.
to do. And uh, I have my favorite th- tail, and we still have her to this day. She's she's still kicking. She's got to be 150 years old at this point. But that tenant, she a uh, little little lady about half, come, about mat size. Let's just say she's like she's like up to here. She's like mat size, and uh, little old lady. And man, she hugged me so hard. Pick, I mean, she picked me up off the ground. My toes got up off the ground when she she gave me a bear hug. I, I couldn't believe it. All because I bought her a turkey. Really, really nice. You know, it wasn't the money that I saved her. Uh, it was the fact that I just didn't have to do that. I'm a guy that does not look at all like her. I'm not. I'm from a completely different type of lifestyle than she, you know, is. And she was just so so happy uh, that you know we were able to have that kind of uh, thing, that kind of moment and bond. And honestly, it was something that we just, you know, it was one of my favorite favorite memories uh, from doing this stuff. But a lot of, oh my god, am I going to cry in live? There's a lot of really great things, uh, you know, that you that that you'll get out of doing this stuff, guys. Uh, I really hope some of you guys take the leap and. Uh, and rent rent homes out at some point. A lot of frustration, a lot of funny stories, a lot of horror stories. There's a lot of great moments like that, and I've uh, definitely had more than a few. And I'm really really proud of that. <clears throat> anyway, okay. Anyway, moving along. I got to get back with the jokes. This is uh, turning into way uh, way too uh, way too soft over here. Uh, a lot of different things you can do on an everyday uh, basis to retain good tenants. Emergency retention. Let's just call it emergency retention, for lack of a better term. Uh, when you're told, hey, I'm leaving, I'm sick of living next to this guy, I am out, you know, I'll leave the keys in the counter, no more, I'm done with you people, I'm done with the neighbor, uh, whatever, I gotta leave, uh, you know, whatever it's gotta be. Um, maybe they give you a 30 day notice, that's great, but you don't always get that, and it's not always worth fighting to get that. Um, like I said, yeah. Um, what do you do, you gotta, jump in, you gotta jump into action. So this type of practice might be similar to an experience with a desire to leave a cell phone or a cable provider for a competitor, and as such might be handled a similar way. So I wrote that up because you know what? I really wanted you guys to think about it like that. Have you ever called to complain about your internet service or your cable service or cell phone, right? And you're like, you know what? I'm gonna cancel you guys. I'm gonna go to AT&T because screw Comcast or whatever it is. And they're like, oh, I'm so sorry to feel you, you, know, you feel that way. Tell you what, let me, let me transfer you to our, um, what do they call it? Uh, not a, a retention department. So literally, that's exactly what they do. They transfer to somebody else, and then they start getting all the cool offers. They're trying to keep your business. They really want to keep you there because it's they know it's cheaper to retain you than it is to get a new you. And we go all the way back to the beginning of this presentation. We put a number there, right? It was like $4,200. That number, I think we can agree, is probably pretty low. Some different things might factor in, but I think that number is either solid or low, and it might be much higher. So think about it that way. Somebody's telling you you're gonna, they're going to leave you, and they're a good tenant. You have a number now, and you got to balance that out. So that's exactly why cell phone companies, cable companies, the second they hear, I'm canceling, I'm going to your competitor, they're like, no, 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 no. Well, oh, well let's talk. Let's talk. It's kind of a similar, similar kind of thing. Use that kind of logic when you think about this. Um, let's switch it over. Emergency retention process. How do you deal? What do you, how does this process work? Well, responding timely. I think that's the most obvious. I put it first on the thing. Immediately jump into action. You don't always get the stuff live. Sometimes it is just a notice or an email. Don't wait a week. Don't wait two weeks to shoot them an email back or drop them a call or go to their house or any of this kind of stuff. Deal with it. As soon as you hear it about it, if, if you're... Amazing, if you're able to hear about this stuff you know, live, deal with it live. Um, understand the reason to move uh, and evaluate the situation, right? Can we overcome their reason for moving? So you gotta dig into it. They're not always gonna tell you why. Some people will straight up lie, some people won't give a, le- a reason. Uh, make sure, sorry, I get so many calls and stuff coming through. And TikTok people, I see that there's people on there. Find us, come, come check us out over on YouTube. Uh, there's a link in our bio, YouTube people, please click the, click the like button. We're really, really trying to build our YouTube channel and reach out with all this free education for people that are out there looking to move their way up the ladder in terms of uh, financial success. We think our channel is going to help out a lot of people. So please click the like button, share our videos, do what you can to help our channel grow. We appreciate it. Understand the reason to move. Got to ask questions. Got to dig in and find the objection of why they won't stick around and stay renting from you. Um, and then evaluate the situation. Is it is it something you can overcome or not? Maybe somebody's moving because they got a job you know, across the country and they're moving, obviously. Right? Maybe they gotta move somewhere else for work or you know for a loved one or for school. Lots of reasons people might might have to move. Some things you can't overcome. That's fine. Uh, but some things you can. So you gotta figure out if it's something, well, is it something I said? Do you have a problem with the neighbor? Is the place too expensive? You know, dig and find and, and figure out if it's something you can a- address and resolve or if it's not. And then negotiate new terms maybe around it that resolve it. So again, this is a lot like if you're calling to cancel your cell phone service. 
they before they let you switch to another carrier and cancel your service, they want to give you all the opportunities they can to figure out a way to keep you there. So responding timely, yeah. If a tenant has provided a 30-day notice, chances are they selected a new home. They're not going to tell you they're moving until they already know where they're moving to. That's pretty normal. Um, act quickly before they sign the new contract. Remember, if you're going to cancel your cell phone service, you don't always, or your your whatever your your internet service, you don't always have moved on to the next carrier. You're canceling one so you can go to the other. Uh, you got to grab them before they've locked in a contract somewhere. Uh, live contact to open negotiations is the best way to begin. I talk about this all the time. Maybe it's because I like doing stuff live, and that's why I love hanging out with you awesome people all the time here on YouTube Live and over on our TikTok channel. TikTok people, tap that screen and then find us over on YouTube Live uh, so we can uh, we can check you out over there. Um, yeah, talk to them live. You're not... Don't go emailing back and forth. Don't write a letter back to them if they wrote a letter and gave you a notice by, by mail. Jeez. Um, call first to the tenant to investigate. Um, email social workers. Sometimes these people are working through rental assistance programs, you know, Section 8, things like this. Find out, hey, what went wrong? You know, have you heard from your client? Uh, I'm really trying to, I, they were a good customer of mine. They're a good tenant. I want to keep renting to them. Do you have any idea why they're looking to move? Um, and then schedule a meeting. If you know, if it, you can show up at their house, knock on the door, all this kind of stuff. But if you get a chance to uh, have a conversation with them, uh, schedule a meeting at the office, at their house. It's to your interest to do whatever you need to do to keep this. Remember, there's a dollar figure. We talked about it. We had it on the phone, on, on the screen. There's a huge dollar figure associated to having to replace a tenant. So think about it. Are you really going to, you know, like, well, you know what? No, I don't want to be inconvenienced. So you've got to come to me, tenant. No, screw that, man. Have that stuff ready to go. Uh, and then have new lease paperwork ready. If you're going to work a deal, we talk about this at the end as well, but if you're going to work a deal with somebody and you're going to get them to uh, to agree to something, be ready to reduce it to writing. Don't just agree to something and let weeks go by before you actually lock it in. That person on the phone at the retention department of your cable company or your cell phone company, that person on the phone is ready right then. Once you agree to put you on the new plan and give you discounts or do whatever they're going to do, they're going to have you do it right there on that call. They're going to be locking it in with you. Kind of the always be closing thing, right? Uh, understand. Attempt to get the tenant to talk about the reasons for leaving, so we can overcome these issues. Common issues: affordability. Plus, I gotta leave. You know, well, why? Oh, you know what? I'm just nah. I just want to change. You know, da, da. a lot of people aren't gonna tell you they don't have money. They can't afford it. Stuff went bad. They lost their job. They 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 got demoted. I don't know. A lot of people aren't gonna talk about it. It's sensitive. It's embarrassing. No problem. You have to dig and and try to find a way to understand. It. If you start under, understanding some of these issues. You can start doing something about it. Affordability. That's a reason people might leave. Size and rooms. Maybe they just had a kid. They need a bigger place. Maybe their kids went off to school. They need a smaller place. Maybe they got divorced. They don't need any. <laughs> they need some other place. Uh, maybe they got crappy neighbors. Yeah. Boy, bad tenant neighbors. Bad tenants you didn't know were bad tenants. No problem. You can fix some of these things. Uh, unavoidable issues. Like I said, relocating out of state. They're moving. They're going to college. They're going to... Uh, they're changing schools, they're changing jobs, lots of different reasons people actually move. Uh, and evaluate the situation. Is this even somebody we want to keep? <laughs> Sometimes you get so focused on, on like the fight, the keeping, and then you start realizing, eh, they kind of suck, to be honest. Like, really, they're pretty messy. We've probably lost good tenants before. I mean, make sure they're a good tenant that are valued enough where you want to keep them. If they're, if they're somebody that's leaving, like, sometimes it's like, sweet, see ya. Like, I'm glad they're leaving. I've had a lot of bad tenants eventually move on. I love that. I'm not trying to keep them. Uh, in fact, I was trying to get them to move on probably unsuccessfully previously. Um, so is this somebody we want to retain? Can you overcome those, uh, those reasons? Compare the cost, like I've been saying, weigh it out. Compare the cost to keep them compared to the cost of losing their business. If it's gonna be very, very expensive to keep them, you have to do something for them. It's gonna be just too expensive to do, then just don't, you know, you have to let them go. You know, it, it is what it is. It makes the decision for you though. Makes this stuff easy. Uh, if so, if you do want to keep them, if you, you think you can keep them, if you can reasonably keep them, uh, immediately may start making it happen. Uh, set up a meeting to discuss further and be ready to sign. Always be closing. Be ready to sign. Write something up. Worst case scenario, you know, you're caught on, on unprepared for this. You set something up in writing. Sign something in writing. And then, you know, you can always make it more formal later, but write it up on a scrap paper or something if you had to, had to. Um, emergency retention, negotiate. Yes, everything's on the table because remember, there's going to be a pretty big cost associated to some of this stuff. 
So don't forget about that. Whenever possible, provide solutions that directly rebut a reason for them wanting to move, right? That, what did I just talk about? We just talked about being too, uh, not affordable. They can't afford it. Okay, you can fix that. What's affordable? You know, what do you mean it's not affordable to you? Uh, yeah, you know, well, I can't afford $1,000 a month anymore. You know, I, I lost some hours at work, blah, blah, blah. Okay, hey, listen, you know, I, I can, knowing that it's going to cost you several, th several thousand dollars to um, do something about it, just knowing that, um, that it's going to cost you 7, 000, several thousand dollars to replace them, knowing that, do you really think you can't afford to reduce the rent 100 bucks a month, 10%? I'll give you 10% reduction. I'll give you 25% reduction. Tell you what, 750 a month, we're going to lock you in for the next year. 750 a month for the first six months while you're, uh, you know, while you're getting your hours back, while you're getting back to, you know, uh, having more income, you know, or 750 a month for the year. Sure. So you took, you took a little bit of a loss. Absolutely. Versus your previous performance. However, it would have been way more expensive for you if you had, if you had to completely replace it. Uh, if a direct rebuttal isn't actually available, no problem. An apartment improvement or a price reduction might work like we talked about. Um, affordability was one thing, but maybe it's n number of bedrooms. Um, it, you know, who knows? Okay. So I don't need such a big apartment. No problem. Tell you what, you know, this is the three bedroom apartment. You only need two or one. I'll rent it for less, you know, yeah, I'll uh, give you the two bedroom rate. Um, always stress the value of changing the tenant, uh, of change to the tenant. Yeah. Example, a $50 reduction, uh, sounds better if we present $600 savings per year. So listen, I'm, I'm prepared to drop your contract by a full $600 this year. How does that sound? I'll save you 600 bucks a year if you lock it in again. Remember, this is just like the same kind of concepts are at play here as what you've all probably had some familiarity with by working through like cell phone carriers, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, internet providers, things like that, cable providers. Um, so you don't just be like, look, I knock your rent, 50 bucks a month off your rent, doesn't sound like a whole lot. So, you know, listen, I mean, you can give them that number, but then really talk about the highlight, the fact that every year I'll, I'll save you $600 a year. I mean, with an extra 600 bucks a year, uh, you know, in your pocket, would that make a difference if you, if you, you know, continue renting for me versus all the headache of moving to a new place. Once you understand the objection of the apartment, it makes the most sense to negotiate towards methods that resolve those issues directly. Obviously, um, there could be a lot of things that, listen, I really wanted a cat, you know, or my, my you know, so-and-so, you know, um, passed away, I need to take care of their cat. You have a no, no pet policy, you have no cat policy. So I'm, I'm gonna do the right thing, I'm gonna move because, you know, it's really important I have to take, I want a cat. I have to adopt this cat. Um, okay, well, freaking let them have a cat if that's worth it to you. People don't want to have pets in their property because the cat will damage your place. We're talking again, weigh this out. A cat might damage your place, might, not always. A lot of great responsible pet owners out there. Um, I have a rabbit, she tears my place up though. And uh, she, you know, so it, it could be a, a problem, but on the other hand, is it really as expensive as definitely losing them and having to replace them with somebody else? If that's the worst thing that you, know, you, you have to, to worry about, Maybe, maybe uh, risk it and, and allow them to have the cat if they lock in a new deal. Might be an idea. Uh, a concession towards renovation work within the property is usually our preferred choice. Of course it is. Why is it our preferred choice? As the cost is basically an investment in our property, right? So let's talk about that. You're renting your house and you're renting out an apartment and they say, man, I want to move to a nicer place. I want to move across town or I saw these apartments listed. I want to check them out. They got a pretty nice place that they're renting out for the same price. I, I want to move in over at that at that location. Say, no problem. Nicer apartment. I'll update your kitchen. I'll update your bath in your apartment. You've been a great tenant. I want to keep you here. Why would you want to deal with a U-Haul and moving and changing your mailing and all this other crap? When uh, I'll, I'll, you, you wanted a nicer apartment, presto, I'll make you a nicer apartment. Why is that, a, why is that something you're happy to do? Maybe it does cost you $4,000 to do it, and that's what it would cost to just replace the tenant. Yeah. Why? Because you're investing money into your own property. That's an amazing thing. You sh it's not, you're not spending money. You're investing it back in your own house. You're going to see that back dollar for dollar or better in value. Definitely a smart way to go. Uh, give this live video a thumbs up. Thanks, Brian. And yes, he's right. Give this video live a, a thumb up right here and subscribe if you're not already a subscriber to our channel. Uh, maybe you'll pick up pet rent. That is an amazing question, uh, uh, point, Todd. Now, in our state, pet rent isn't a thing. Um, you can't charge all sorts of rents and fees. So what I always tell everybody, negotiate that in, just call it rent. Listen, no problem. Um, I was looking at, I was looking at redoing your contract anyway. Tell you what, I could be flexible. Uh, we'll go from a thousand dollars a month to 1050 a month and we'll let you have a cat. How does that sound?
no problem. You know, I usually do a rent increase anyway. You're due for an increase. I wanted to go to 1100 maybe. And, uh, you know, but tell you what, if you, I'll, I'll keep you at 1050 and allow the cat. Um, so don't necessarily call it something else other than rent for a few different reasons. Um, and we talked about this a lot, a lot in my live on TikTok recently where uh, I was talking about how I did a uh, rental adjustment, not necessarily increase, a rental adjustment for a tenant who lived in a single family house, one house. And what the deal was for them is they were paying $1,500 for the single family house rental. And they were responsible for all their utilities, including being responsible for the water and sewer bill. In our city, uh, in that city, uh, the water and sewer bill has to stay in the owner's name. They don't let it get transferred to a tenant. So the deal is the owner pays the water and sewer bill and then the owner invoices the tenant for the water sewer bill. Tenant wasn't paying it. it was, they were racking up, uh, we'll say 200 bucks a month uh, for the water and sewer cost. Never paying it, they owed thousands in water and sewer. Um, because the rent was 1500 and they were paying the rent, but they weren't paying this other charge, I couldn't evict them for non-payment of rent because the rent's paid. Uh, and all I can do to collect this other charge is take them to small claims court basically uh, and get a judgment against them, which most people in, in these kind of scenarios, they don't care about a judgment. It actually doesn't harm them. They're what's called judgment proof. So um, what I said wisely, I said, listen, let's do this. Their contract's up. Let's just charge them more rent and we'll include water and sewer. Now they have to, instead of, they were supposed to pay $1,700 a month total before, 15 for the rent, 200 for their water usage. We're gonna charge them 1650. We're gonna charge them 1650, but we're gonna include rent underneath uh, uh, water and sewer as part of that. And now if they don't pay the full cost of living there, 1650 each month, any money that they're out, they're short, is unpaid rent, and we can finally hold them accountable uh, with an eviction threat. So um, a consequence kept them honest and made it so they pay. Uh, so they still owe thousands of dollars on unpaid water costs. Sure, I can still chase them for that and work on them for that over time. doesn't matter. It's not going up. So at this point, it's already water under a bridge. Water under a bridge. Uh, but at this point, you know, I can at least make sure that they don't damage me further. All their expenses are paid every month. And if they don't, they get a notice to get uh, evicted. So same kind of thing. Maybe pet rent might fall into that same kind of category. Again, we don't have that here. We can't charge them $1,000 rent and then an extra 50 for pets. Um, but otherwise, factor it in as part of it. Um, we were talking here back to the, uh, to the presentation here. Uh, we were talking about... Um, you know, maybe they wanted to move because their apartment was a little bit dated. They saw all their stuff being advertised for the same kind of price. And they said, you know what? I want to live over there with a nicer updated kitchen and the cooler bathroom. Yeah. Uh, and you say, no problem. That's your biggest problem. Well, I wish you had talked to me about it sooner. Tell you what, don't even bother looking at those places. I'll take care of this. I'll remodel your kitchen, your bathroom. You're a great tenant. I want you to stay. No problem at all. You're the best. <laughs> you know, sign a new two-year deal. And, I'll, and this is what I'll do for you. And then you'll have this place locked in for two years. You won't have to ever worry about moving. You know, get it locked in and then make an investment into your own property. Now you have a house that's got an updated bathroom and kitchen. That's great. That's good for you. You own the place. It appraises for more. You can refi, pull that money out, buy another property with it. Even if the tenant skips town the following month, the money we've invested stays with the apartment. So yeah, they, they maybe, it, maybe you did sign a one-year deal or a two-year deal, and then something happens, and they, they skate on you, uh, or you agree you know, to let them leave anyway two months later. Oh, okay, not the end of the world. You still you invested money into your own house. That's worst case scenario, you know. Um, lower priority concessions should be rent reductions. It's easy, super easy, very common. Security deposit applied to rent. There you go. So why do you want to leave? Well, it's stuff's you know, uh, money's a little bit short. I was hoping to buy a car. I was going to move into a less expensive place. Okay, well, what if I, you know, knock 50 bucks a month off your rent? Or what if we did this? What if it's, tell you what, we're holding a security deposit for you. Um, you've been renting for me for a few years now. Clearly, you haven't trashed a place. Obviously, I don't think you're going to be the kind of person that's going to all of a sudden trash the place. So tell you what, why don't you, uh, tell you what, I'll take your security apply it, apply, apply, deposit, geez, and I'll apply it to your account. So next month, no rent. You don't have to pay it. It's, it's already taken care of. I took your security. You're running a risk as a landlord. Now you don't have a security, but that's okay. I mean, you, you assess the situation, you made the, the determination to go that route. They're clearly based on their multi-year history of using that apartment. They haven't trashed the place, so probably not gonna turn into somebody that's all of a sudden gonna trash the place. You could also, uh, you could either apply it to the month of rent upcoming, you know, and, and have them have no rent for the next month, and they'll love that, or you could even say, listen, you'll stretch it out over the course of the year, um, and it will give them a, a significant reduction. Uh, so. They have a $1,000 or $1,200 for easy math security deposit. Uh, you're gonna stretch it out over the course of the year, apply it a month each month. 
100 bucks less each month. Maybe with a small rent reduction on top of that, 50 bucks, 100 bucks a month on your own. Um, they're saving themselves $200 a month in terms of monthly payment. That is a huge chunk of money towards that car payment that they're trying to afford. A lot of different creative ways to keep these people. Uh, I see another uh, I see another text coming in from Top Numbers. Hey, good to see you, Top Numbers. I recognize you from TikTok. Thanks for being here. Anybody that's still over on TikTok, please find us over on our YouTube Live by, well, clicking the Stand With Me link in our bio and then checking us out over there on YouTube Live. Does lowering the rent lowers the value of your property? Good question. Um, I would not say lowering by 50 bucks is going to make all that much of a difference. And don't forget, in smaller properties, multifamily homes, two, three, four-unit houses, they're mostly judged by comparable properties in the area, less judged on the value of their leases in those apartments. So um, great question. Yeah, to an investor, when he's really, really, like, really, really honing in and trying to decide to buy it or not to buy it, they may not, they may not, they may say, listen, this place only generates, you know, $3,000 a month instead of, you know, $3,300 or $3,500. But they might also look at it another way. And so they say, listen, I'm not, so I'm not going to pay very much for it or as much for it because the you know, rents don't make it very valuable. They might look at it another way and they'll analyze what, what they could really be getting for rents and they'll see it as an opportunity. So they'll look at it if they were to buy it uh, and say, listen, well, I could, I could probably push up the rents here because this guy's been renting it for a thousand. These units are all in this area. These units are all going for at least 1200. So, you know, I, I know that if it worked at 3000 with my numbers and I made a little bit of money, it'll definitely work when I actually optimize the property and it's room for improvement. It's a value add. That's how an investor might look at it. But mostly in a smaller multifamily home, they're going to be looked at by comparable three family houses that are all three bedroom units that kind of thing. Now, when you get into commercial or like commercial sized, real bigger properties, then yes, that, that absolutely, that's definitely going to play a lot more into it. The uh, the cranked up rents and everything being super optimized will have a direct impact on the market value of the property. So it's a great question. Uh, but on a smaller scale, I wouldn't worry about it too, too much. Remember, that's also something you can, you can deal with later when you get to the point where you want to sell. This might be something you're doing right now to continue owning and operating. Um, yeah, so we talked about a few things like that. Maybe even gifts. I don't know. You know, come up with some kind of a thing that you could do or provide. I like to do something that provides to the property that stays in the property because that's a great way to save. You know, uh, on it because it's something you're spending on your own location. Um, creative ideas. Install home security systems. Added security. People love that, and it's expensive. Or maybe reimburse them for like a um, a provided a provider internet security uh, package like Comcast or uh, whatever. They bundle all these things. Maybe you say, listen, if you subscribe to such and such, send me your bill each month and I'll credit it to you on your, you know, on your account um, so you have a good home security system. That might be a reason that they want to move. Maybe they want to move to a nicer neighborhood or what they think is a nicer neighborhood. Maybe they want to move to a, a different place that has different amenities. You, can, you don't want to maybe have to go through and do an installation for a whole security system, but maybe they can subscribe to one or do it and you could work that in as something you uh, subsidize basically for them. Um, you know, maybe have another apartment. You know, they're a good tenant. Move them somewhere. Jeez, give them another apartment. Best case scenario, worst case scenario, you can't get them to stay there. Okay, no problem. You know, they need a bigger place. They just had twins. They need a bigger place. You can't knock 50 bucks off and keep these people crammed in the same apartment. No problem. Tell you what, you've been running me for five years now. You're a great tenant. I got this other place becoming available. If you can wait another month, I can get you moved in at 123 Fake Street. How does that sound? Let's go check it out. I'll let you take a peek at it today. And, uh, Oh, okay. I didn't know you had other properties. That's great. Yeah. I was going to go rent from some other person, but that sounds fantastic. I've been renting from you for a while. You're pretty fair. You're pretty honest and you got a great sense of humor and a, you know, amazing nose, right? So uh, I'll keep renting from you. Sure. Yeah. I'll just go take out that other property. Um, yeah. So that, there's a couple of thoughts there. Uh, what do we get? What do we get when you negotiate? So each time we offer a concession, it needs to come with some commitment from the tenant. Don't just like give them something and not make them give you something in exchange. Uh, what are you, what are they going to get? Uh, what are they going to give you? What are you going to get? Uh, the bigger the concession, the bigger the commitment. I love this, right? Uh, so a couple of years extension probably is probably what you'd be looking for. You want uh, to know this person's in set, locked in, contractually obligated to the property, and you're going to have that place locked in for the next two years. So you can focus on other stuff. Really, really important. Uh, we'd be happy to fully update your kitchen or bathroom in exchange for a two-year renewal and a $25 a month increase. Maybe you can even work some terms in there. Maybe some of their objections are stuff that you can overcome and still make more money on the unit. Who knows? Maybe you can say, listen, it's going to cost me 
I mean, I'd be happy to do a kitchen and bath upgrade, but it's going to cost me like $10,000. I, I just can't do that without changing the rent a little bit. I mean, tell you what, if I did a full remodel for you, could we just change, increase the rent a little, uh, just a little, little, you know, and, and get it locked in. Um, so these are all just good things. I mean, this is simple negotiation type stuff where if you give something or something's asked of you, you get something from it. Um, and this is for, you know, great, great type of negotiation stuff that you can apply to almost anything. Uh, any thoughts on tax sales, uh, deed state? I'm like, so uh, I, I appreciate it. We, um, we're talking about tenant retention and tenant screening today, uh, Al, on this one. And we'd love to have able to help you out with some of your questions. If you could, we have a lot of YouTube video content already made that's recorded, not live like today is right now. Um, so if you want, you can please, you can find us uh, on YouTube. That's Two Guys Take on Real Estate. If you haven't subscribed uh, and scroll through our videos, if you would, you're more than welcome to drop a, qu a question on our tax-related uh, YouTube content, or you can check out the stand with me link that's on our videos as well, including on our TikTok bio. And you can do the ask us anything feature and myself and Matt will be able to get back to you with a video reply, answering your questions directly. Do you lose anything by moving the existing tenant to another one of your apartments? Um, you do. I mean, you still, don't forget, you're still going to have a vacancy uh, at this old unit that they're in. So uh, top, uh, it's a great question. It doesn't solve your issue that we originally talked about where now you have a vacant apartment you have to do renovation work. Contractors aren't available right away. So you have some downtime while it sits vacant, while you're waiting for a contractor to fix it. Um, you've got an expense of the contractor. They're going to cost you money. And then you've got to start a showing process and a screening process like we were talking about earlier to get that unit refilled. More vacancy, maybe some more expense and some more, more headache and work for you. So it doesn't fix those problems. Those problems will still exist. However, at least you know if you have a good tenant, you can maybe quickly fill a vacancy upcoming somewhere else. Maybe a planned vacancy is happening and you can use that shift uh, to limit the amount that that happens on another one of your properties. Again, these are uh, first world problems. These are great problems to have if you're a landlord because you have probably that means many, many units. So if you have 20, 30, 50 units, which sounds crazy and it's, it's just not that bad. I mean, think about it. One house a year, one three or four family house a year gets you up into those kind of numbers. Um, and buying and getting one house a year on, online and going and working properly is not that daunting. Even if you're you know, a working, like, career-driven person, you can do this stuff in that kind of timeline. That's your five-year plan to financial freedom right there. Uh, like we talked about a minute ago, closing the deal, absolutely, right? Once you've overcome the reason for moving, we need to swiftly close the deal by putting it in writing. Lock it in with that contract. They don't. They do this on those on those options on the phone systems when you're calling in to cancel your internet plan. They as soon as you say okay, I mean I'll take the I'll take the uh, you know new customer plan, the great rates and all that stuff. I'll do it. Like okay, so if you'd like, I'd be happy to do your contract with you right now. And you know they they lock you in right there when you agree. Be prepared and all and have the ability to lock in the tenancy. Delays at this point may cause a, a tenant to flip flop. I wanting to, to vacate again. Absolutely. People sometimes they, they, I've seen sellers and buyers remorse all the time. Somebody buys something, they leave, they, they, they're super happy. They go home, they think about it. Oh my gosh, what did I do? I spent way more than I thought I was going to. I only went into that store to buy a cord and I came out with a TV. Uh, I, I shouldn't have done this. It's so expensive. I got bills to pay. I'm taking it back. And they go back the next day. They made a decision. They made a decision. They were super happy with it. Um, but if you don't lock it in and get them sign that contract, they might undecide. They might make that decision all over again. Ah, you know what? No, I was right the first time. I'm going to move across town after all. Um, no, you, you, you sold them. If you're going to sell them something, don't let that something come back. So lock them in. I mean, absolutely. Each lease uh, might need to be altered to reflect a new deal that was negotiated. Yeah, if you're ready to sign, you've got a lease agreement, you might have to just by hand cross a couple things out, scribble in a couple of different terms. That no pet policy that you've got, cross that out. It says one cat named Muffin, you know, is allowed. You know, take a picture of the cat. Maybe, I don't know, right? And and put it in there. It doesn't have to be super amazingly like uh, uh, um, um, just a like business, you know, looking. It, it can look like you, you chicken scratch this stuff. Lock it in. So that way they, they can't, um, and it's not like you're trying to trap somebody, it's you're trying to prevent them from allowing themselves to go to, go sit at home and think about what they did and they regret their decision uh, and, and know that that store has a return policy so they can bring that product back. They don't have a return policy, they signed a contract. They're not gonna second guess it as much as they know, yeah, well, you know, I already signed the contract, so I guess I'm, you know, I'm, 
I made my decision. They're not going to sit there and be like, well, I'll just maybe I'll take it to the store tomorrow. They know it's so easy to return something in a store. It's not easy to get out of a contract. So don't let them think that it is. Lock them into something. You made a, a, an agreement with somebody. You worked together and you came up with a plan. Um, everybody was super happy. Put it in writing and then move on. You know, And they won't go home and, and rethink it and decide to change your mind on it and then try to unwind the deal. Uh, anyway, I think that's pretty much it here. It's, uh, yeah, that's the last of the slide. So if you thought this was somewhat helpful, this is the kind of stuff we're going to be doing a lot more of this. This is going to go up in the Stand With Me link that you can find in our uh, bios on TikTok and in our YouTube uh, channel. The Stand With Me link is going to have this in it. Now, it might be that I just gave it away to everybody. So I might be up there for free. We're always trying to expand our completely free content. You can help us do that by clicking on our stuff and clicking like, subscribe, and by sharing it to more people. If we're able to blow up and just have thousands and thousands and thousands of people watching our stuff all the time, we will continue to be able to crank out more of this free stuff for you all the time and start putting it onto our Stand With Me link. We'll start spending as much time and putting as much content as possible. You can get that to happen for you and for all these other awesome people out there that haven't even found us yet. Uh, by just clicking like, sharing our stuff, and helping us blow up. So please take a second to do that now. And if you're on TikTok and you haven't followed us uh, over to our live stream over on YouTube, please check us out there. The link is right in our bio, and you can do that. Uh, how enforceable is contract? Um, great, great question. So I don't want to go too much into this. Um, how enforceable is the contract? Psychologically, right there, psychologically, there's a big value, a big value to it. Because uh, when somebody knows they signed a contract, um, they're sometimes thinking to get out of this, they have to fight it, get a lawyer, go to court, all this other stuff. And they say, man, that's, that's not just like easy, you, you know? Um, now in some States and in some relationships, it just doesn't make sense to really try to enforce that contract. So they don't need to know that you might never really hold somebody's feet to the fire to perform on a contract that they signed. And if push came to shove, you're never going to chase them. They don't necessarily need to know that. So psychologically, they feel like they signed something, they committed something. It's lowers the percentage of them wanting to challenge and uh, make you enforce the contract. Um, and then aside from that, you know, to really um, try to wiggle out of a contract and get out of these kind of things, um, they might have to, you know, figure out a way to, to nullify that contract a little bit. And they might perceive that as being expensive and time consuming and a headache. So uh, what they'll be doing is weighing themselves out, you know, how much, um, you, you know, they can make you really have to try to enforce it. Now, when it comes to, like I said, when it comes to uh, any of this kind of stuff, when it comes to chasing people for debts, um, you have to weigh out, like, is the chase really worth the potential for payoff? And in a lot of cases with lower quality, everything, people that have no credit, no income, no, or no, no career or job. And all their income is from like a welfare safety net type of uh, income. Like it's given to them by the state. You can't garnish it. They're not worried about their credit because their credit already sucks. What do you really have to gain by chasing them and getting a judgment against them through a court? Um, you have a lot of time and headache and cost of it, uh, associated with doing those things. And you can't garnish their wages. You, you know, they're, they're not going to roll over and pay you because they, they're worried about a judgment going against them. Their credit's already trash. So that these are the kind of things that you weigh and they weigh often when you're working on these things. So Every contract can always be challenged. It's just always the, the, the situation. Um, but all the parties end up doing is laying out, you know, uh, how, how much uh, effort it takes to prevail on which side they're on. But uh, I always do that too. I, I always say, yeah, no, we can probably really, you know, really stick it to these guys, you know, if we wanted to. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, how much do I want to is the biggest thing. So a, a contract sometimes is enforceable or unenforceable is you want to let it be. Uh, thanks for putting this together. These energize me to do more residential. Seriously, we talk about a lot of doom and gloom. It's always like bad tenants this and bad tenants that and oh my gosh, horror stories. Think about it. You don't talk about the people that, I mean, you go to Dunkin' Donuts, you go to Starbucks or hopefully Dunkin' Donuts and they get your order right and you leave. You don't go to work and tell everybody, hey, Dunkin' Donuts got my order right. Everything was, you know, just normal, I guess, today. No, you, 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 you talk about it when they screw it up. You go into dunk, you go into work and you're like, oh my God, these idiots. They freaking get my coffee wrong every day. What's so hard about no, you know, no sugar or whatever it is, right? You complain about it, you vocalize it. Oh my God, this time this and such and such that, right? You only talk about the horror stories. Nobody really talks about stuff working out just the right way. So um, that's good. I mean, you know, because, uh, you know, we, we, a lot of our tenants really 
just idle along. And, uh, it, you know, when you when you get good at this stuff, the, the, the horror stories um, become much more rare or much more manageable. Uh, and so, you know, we want to share with you guys our experiences and our techniques and some of our, um, you know, really our, our time that we have that we put into this so that you have the ability to manage these kind of things. You can be very successful doing this. There's so many different ways to be profitable and successful in real estate. No matter what market is doing, the market is doing or what region you live in, there's different types of real estate you can be involved in and really want to help you, you know, find those things out. So please, if you haven't already, scroll through some of our existing videos. Uh, we do go live now every week. We're still learning the YouTube live, but we're going live every week on YouTube and we really want to be here for you guys. So check our stuff out. All we ask is that if we help you, let us know if you, you know, if you find that you're energized, if you find that you have some experience, if you bought your first house, drop a comment, say, Hey, you know, I've been watching you guys for six months. I bought my first multi or say, Hey, you know what? Uh, I'm, I'm taking my first step. You always say it on your channels. The first step to getting involved in real estate is learning about real estate. And I'm watching your videos. I'm learning, I'm trying to stick with it. Um, you're going to get feedback from other people. You're going to get motivation from other people that have bought their first property, uh, have bought their 10th property, or that are also just learning and following along. We have so many awesome people that are on this channel uh, here and on our YouTube channel. We got two things going right now. Uh, so we really, really love to see people uh, helping support each other. And guess what? A lot of people out there are reading your comments and they're not commenting. And that's cool because they're reading your comments and they're seeing for themselves, they're seeing, wow, regular people out there are seeing this stuff. They're doing something. They're moving forward on it. They're watching. They're learning. They're hopeful. Uh, and they're determined to grow and improve. I'm going to do the same thing. So they love to see your comments, even if they're not the kind of people that are going to put their own comments out there too. You're helping somebody by giving comments and giving some feedback. You're helping somebody kick uh, kick some butt out there and keep moving forward. There's a lot of stuff to watch on YouTube. I spent way too much time watching non-productive stuff on YouTube. So as much time as you can spend on the good productive stuff that will help you, even if you're not ready for it right now, but you're ready for it next year, you can't start doing something next year if you didn't learn about it this year. So stick around, keep us uh, keep us on your playlist and keep watching. Uh, inflatable hot tub in the basement, pinball, paintball machine in the house. Seen a fair share of it? <laughs> fair share of it. I've seen everything. I swear to God, yeah. No, I've seen it all too. Every every time I say that, uh, something new happens. Uh, this past week, my, the first time that I had to go into a house with a, with some police and um, the people were upstairs hiding and there were squatters and they had a police scanner. These people didn't have electricity. They didn't have hot water. They didn't have furniture, but they had batteries and a police scanner. And it was the first time I've ever had that level of squatterness, you know, grossness uh, coupled with a police scanner monitoring the police who were coming to his door. Pretty interesting stuff. Uh, in the learning stage right now, planning on making my first multi uh, purchase soon. This is very helpful. Uh, would love to see more. Yeah, well, we're not going anywhere as far as I know. So what chances are next week we'll be back with two guys taking on real estate instead of half of that right now. So me and Matt, uh, you know, we, we're going to continue to do as much as we can to help you guys uh, out there because you know what? We had a very long 12 years. I always say it feels like 35. We had a very, very long 12 years of doing this stuff. We made every mistake there is to make. We didn't know what we were doing when we started. We learned by doing and we overcame by simply doubling down and working harder. Uh, you know, so we want to help you guys avoid some of that. Uh, hard work is great. Hard work is good. There's going to be plenty of it. If we can make things a little bit easier, if we can help you navigate that minefield a little better, uh, we're definitely looking to do that. Uh, jumper cables at the meter. Oh yeah. Keep it up. Thanks again. No problem. Absolutely. Todd, I appreciate you being here and everybody that's on our YouTube live comments right now. Thank you again very, very much for everybody saying hello, uh, for everybody on YouTube that clicked like already. And everybody that hasn't, dude, click the button. It costs you nothing to click like on a video. What, what's stopping you? And uh, more and more people will be able to see it. It'll get replayed and more and more people will be able to be reached. Tag some people, share some people. There's a lot of awesome stuff that we provide that'll help you get started uh, or move forward on your path to financial freedom and success in the world of real estate. So stick around. I'm going to wrap it up for today. And I'm going to go, speaking of which, I'm going to go get some work done here for myself and uh probably have to work on a TikTok video to get posted today. So one of the things you can also do is drop a comment on this. Let us know what other TikTok or short videos that we post on YouTube as well, uh, videos you'd like to see done uh, as topics, and we'll do our best to crank some of those out for you too. Thanks so much for being part of this, guys. Everybody over there on TikTok, if you're still here and you didn't watch it on YouTube, shame on you, but it's not too late. Find us over there. You can explore our Stand With Me links in our uh, bio and our descriptions of our videos. Please find us. Please check us out on Stand With Me. 
and uh, check out our YouTube channel for longer full length videos about all the stuff you see in short on TikTok and awesome YouTube people. We really, really, really appreciate you spending so much time with us today. We have a blast doing this. We really do. And uh, you know, we have a, we've met so many awesome people. We've made so many great connections here and I love seeing so many of the regulars coming into our chats and saying hello and keeping us posted. So stick around guys and we'll see you on the next broadcast. Take care.